What's going on, good people of the internet? It's time for On Comics Rounds.com's flagship podcast, Panel to Panel, where a bunch of folks shoot the breeze and talk about comic books and such. We are back once again, once again. We are talking about all that good comic and nerdy goodness that we always do here on this broadcast. We have waited, finally, after eight weeks. Actually, no, technically it was five weeks, because the first three dropped together. So five weeks, we have waited for this show to fully be done so we could fully discuss it. We did our, our, our initial first impressions when the first three episodes dropped, but now we are here talking about The Boys. Amazon Prime's The Boys, we are here talking about it. This will be a full analysis. That was, will be a full spoiler re- re- review and dissection. So, please, if you have not watched the final episode of The Boys Season 2, please come back later. We'll be here. Don't you worry. You can find us on all major uh, audio platforms like Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, YouTube, all those great places. So you can come back when you have watched the, 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 the entirety of the season, and then you can listen to our dissection of all of this craziness. So don't forget that you can follow us on Twitter at PTP underscore podcast, and that you can follow the website on Comics Ground on Twitter and Instagram at on Comics Ground. And you can check out the website on comicsground.com with some hyphens between those words for me, where you can check out all of our reviews, previews, solicitations, and all that great stuff. My name is James Portis. My pauses between words are rough today, but I don't care. Um, to my left, we have Mr. Afro Baggins himself, the man who be working hard as Mermaid Man for some reason. I don't know why he's not being Cat Noir, but he will not listen to me. Evil! <laughs> and- <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, I don't know why he, he's like this, but um, we have Travis Tucker. How are you doing this evening? I'm doing well. Shut your ass up. You know you love me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then we have to my right, we have the woman who has healed her body from being sick. She has returned to drop all the hot takes on this season. We have Mary. How are you doing this evening? I'm grumpy we have to use Streamlabs because of the where's my voice. <laughs> hey, man, talk, talk, talk to Craig. Craig. Craig wanted to malfunction, so we had to use ulterior uh, methods. My voice is half octave higher than this, so please don't judge me. <laughs> <laughs> half octave higher. <laughs> and then uh, across the table... Across the table, we have our special guest. We have, um, uh, from our, uh, freaking, I cannot work today, from our sister podcast, Living on the Edge, our Spider-Man podcast, we have Alec rejoining us from last week. He wanted to come back on and talk about this show with us, so we wanted to bring him on and talk about this crazy-ass show. Alec, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling good, because, uh, last night... Uh, the one and only Jack Quaid replied to me on Twitter. Nice, nice. Gave some good words of encouragement because it because Huey and this show have really helped me through my own anxiety when it first came out. So I just talked. I just tweeted at him, and he said, "Thank." He said, "Glad you're doing good." So I'm, I'm gonna just take that and frame it on my wall forever. <laughs> uh, I but, just uh, hope you're. In- I just hope your anxiety doesn't take you literally through the body of a whale. Oh, <laughs> God. <laughs> oh. I, I, will, I will try. I can't guarantee anything, but I <laughs> you don't make You make no promises. I make no promises, no. So, uh, but, b- b- before we begin, um, does anyone want a fresca? Fuck, fuck fresca. fresca. <laughs> <laughs> that was the Something best moment. Completely benign. Something completely benign that I want to point out is how much money is Billy Joel making from this show? I don't know. Oh, I, I oh, really want to know. In it. More I mean, money than he needed. <laughs> I like 
I like Uptown Girl as much as the next white person, but oh my god, how much money is he making from the show? I mean, come on, that that trailer with We Didn't Start the Fire, the A plus editing on that. Bro, no, the freaking oh. I'm surprised they haven't used. Have they used Uptown Girl yet? I don't think they have. They've talked about it. They mentioned it, but they haven't actually played the song. Yeah, they haven't played the that's song. Like, that's like the white people anthem. <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong? Yes, uh, you're not wrong. <laughs> find it's a scary white pie. pie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Find a white person, and they like know the lyrics to Uptown Girl. Oh, okay. I will be the one person who doesn't know those lyrics. <laughs> so we're gonna dive into this. Stop subverting my narrative. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So um, we are gonna go ahead and, g- and give our initial thoughts on this crazy ass season. But like, so if, like, if, if, like, if there is any of y'all that really held out. And really just want to know our initial thoughts. This is going to be your last chance to sit up for a second. Like, actually, this is our overall thoughts. So, yeah, we won't go too deep into spoilers. This is, like, overall thoughts. But, um, uh, Travis, you were the, were the MVP and were watching episodes before Mary and I. Because I would fall behind occasionally. So, uh, Travis, I want you to give your overall thoughts on the season proper. I fucking loved it. <laughs> just to put it... I don't want to, like, I, I'm going to tell you about why, but, like, just to skip the mincing words, I fucking love this season. I have a serious soft spot for for Superman archetypes that are also fucking sociopaths. So you can bet, like, because I'm an Irredeemable fan, I love this Homelander. Because this Homelander, he, he had a purpose, you know what I mean? He wanted, he had that mommy complex, and he just wanted to be loved the whole time, but he... He's so damaged, he doesn't know how to do it. Mm -hmm. With the amount of power he has, there's no respect for anything. So watching him kind of fumble around his own emotions and how he would lash out with his powers was probably my favorite part of this whole season, to be completely honest with you, because it really showed me how unhinged Homelander has always been. All right. And then the, the opposite of that would be Butcher, and, you know, he's powerless and has nothing to lose, so he does everything he can in his power, but he has no power, so everything goes wrong. Yup. And then he ended up so rising much. above it. All the struggle that he went through, he ended up making the adult choice and making the right decision, which was his insanity. Right. It's just so good. <laughs> okay um mary what were your overall thoughts on this crazy ass season and how much do you want a mave uh, a pride bar i definitely the, the pride bar the pride lasagna brave mave veggie i want all of it because it's <laughs> stupid and ridiculous <laughs> i want to know what's in the pride bar so badly like i i just i need to know it's just, we'll have to talk about that later, but the way they did this whole, you know, public coming out thing, it is so goddamn funny. Because and I think that's something that, because I'm definitely obviously backing up Travis's point that this season is so fucking good. Mm-hmm. This is deconstructionism done right. Because I am a, I, I'm a hoe for superhero deconstructionism. You guys know this. Like, yes. deconstructing is, is, like, my favorite pastime because, you know, I have no hobbies. Um but this it pulls in so many elements and it makes such subtle points that you don't you don't always catch them the first time around. I have a really spicy hot take I'm excited to get to later. Ooh. But it I think this was just such a, a season that was so well written. And you know, I've read I I've read the boys multiple times. It's been a while, but I have read it. Um I was really nervous about what they were gonna do with Stormfront. Because I'm like, okay, Stormfront is, you know, going into it. You knew what the the whole, you know, quote unquote twist was going to be with Stormfront. But they twisted it on its head. And I'm like, how are they going to do this? And then they, you know, they, they did it in such a way that just it, it made it work. And I really loved it. And I think, um, you know, something from season one and season two that really astounded me was that the costume designers, they deserve all the credit in the world for this show. Mm. I want to make that point before I forget it, but no, the costume designers did beautifully with this. And I just, I loved it. You know, her suit was, like, so well made. They even had little, like, uh, American, like, like flag metallic thing on her on her arms. Like, that was just mwah, beautiful. Um, 
uh, Alec, you were the guest, but I'll, I'll I'll let you speak before I go in. Uh, try to keep it too brief. This is just overall thoughts. How how do you how did you feel watching this season? Because you like you seemed in our Discord chats that you were very excited about this season. So how did you feel? I, I where do I begin? I'm gonna <laughs> I will keep it brief. I promise. But uh, um, it was just like it hit every right note with me. And I mean, I really loved season one, uh, but at the same time, season one, it was very, in, like, it was good character building, but it felt like it was just that. And I was kind of lacking, like, things, like, not action scenes or whatever, because, I mean, that's not the point, but I mean, like, big plot points happening and the characters being put in, like, these crazy situations and this season gave me that and it gave me like it gave me that and then some and uh like mary was saying uh, i was nervous about how they were going to do stormfront i was scared they were just going to be like oh no she's not a nazi she's just just so, as the name stormfront even though she even yeah. though her name is the name of a white supremacist website and she has the iron eagle on her suit it's just going to you know, be like, yo, oh, don't worry. But they went all in with it. And Absolutely. like even more so than I expected. Mm. Um also just like every character, every main I feel like the only two characters who were shafted this season were the deep in A Train. I disagree uh, with you. We'll talk about that, but we'll but, but go ahead. Um like they did do stuff, but like A Train is like A Train especially was just kind of like there for some episodes, and then like as we'll talk about later, he did something. Uh, yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, no, like I just every main player at least uh, got so much well deserved development, especially Frenchie, and Frenchy, I was yes. Yes. I was like so happy that they gave him the time to shine they gave uh kimiko time to shine um i i love the two of them together they're they're just adorable mm -hmm. um uh huey remains my favorite character over all of them he's just like i i just i love seeing the boy grow <laughs> so that's valid but but uh yeah no um i thought this was a very good season. Dope. I've, I have no clue where season three is going to go. That's all I'll say. I got I got a couple ideas. We'll, we'll get to that towards the end of the, of the episode. But um, for me, I went in thinking this this whole season. I, I thought I had the whole season mapped out in my head from what I'd seen from trailers, from what I'd seen from like the casting of, of Stormfront as a female. I thought I, I knew how this was going to go. And they just dove out the motherfucking window when they were supposed to stay on the subway train. Like, they were supposed to keep going down the road, uh, the, the road and they said, nope, we're going to keep going this way, and we're going to ignore everything you thought you, you there's nothing going to go. go. I thought Butcher was going to be gone longer. I thought um, the plot twist at the end was gonna go differently. I thought Deep was gonna get like a lot more development than he did. Um, I thought there was gonna be a lot more racism than what we got. I expected a lot more motherfucking racism, but I, like that's why when I saw a couple uh, Black Nerd websites being like "fuck Stormfront," I'm like, you realize this could have been a lot worse, right? That's what I was saying off the rip. Like, and I, I even tweeted at them like, y'all, y'all realize this could have been worse. But anyway, um, that's my beef with some people. But anyway. It was an issue, uh, like, for the rest of the season, um, I think the unspoken hero of this season, I have to give um, uh, Colby uh, Menifee her shout-out, because her as Ashley Barrett is just on point. She is... <laughs> Ashley didn't, she doesn't get paid enough for this. Right, like, she is going through hell. Like, she watched a fucking blind man get slapped in the fucking ears. She watched, like, her, like a bunch of people die in this courtroom. She had to deal with the stress of Starlight not being where she was supposed to be. Like, everything that kept happening, like, you felt Ashley's pain. And there would be, like, talks on Twitter about, like, everybody in the world is just Ashley at this point. Yeah, yeah, 
no, like, like, so I, I think she needs so much credit because she worked her ass off this season and she deserves that. Um, but no, this season blew my expectations out of the water. I have a couple ideas about how next season's gonna go. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. But for here, can I just say real quick? Go ahead. It's really funny that both her and Aaron Moriarty were both in Jessica Jones. Yes. Like, um, <laughs> but no. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna like go over the core characters a little bit. I'm gonna like sort of do it in groups a little bit because I'm, I'm gonna pull a um, um, freaking what they did at the at the at the, at the, at the little panel they did. Um, so the boys, but and by the, specifically the boys, I mean Butcher, Frenchie, uh, uh, Mother's Milk um Huey and I'm I'm going to like we'll do Starlight as her own piece cuz she's both part of the team and not part of the team but and Kimiko that group I want to I want to get y'all's thoughts I'm going to start with Butcher Butcher was this like he went through a metamorphosis this season <laughs> he yes. had, he had to go through some hard lessons to deal with real shit. growth the real motherfucking growth like he went from having his life spared by his wife literally saying you you do something to him i will literally kill myself and ruin this child like that struck a chord with me that she was willing to save this man's life just because of all of that was going on even though she's been trapped with this child for so many years she still was like dog you kill him, it's over. Everything just goes out the freaking window. That was just beautiful to me. And then from there, you see Butcher going on this this, this giant growth tour, as I, like, I wanted to call it, because he, he he starts getting closer to Huey. He has to deal with his baggage of his of his younger brother. He has to like com- like combat his abusive father. Like he goes through all this in eight episodes, and you're just blown away. And like and then he has to come with the grips of the fact that him and Becca aren't meant to be together. And then. Like oh, he he finally learns that lesson right before it, the, the choice would be snatched from him regardless, and I was just blown away by that. I love Butcher's growth. Um, uh, to Alex's point about the deep and A Train getting the shaft this season, if anybody got the shaft this season, it was Mother's Milk. Laz Alonso got the biggest shaft at this entire season because other than when they went on the road trip and they they highlighted his OCD and that was beautiful because um, Laz Alonso does have OCD in real life and I love that they actually cared about showing that. That was awesome. But other than the, the talks about his dad and the struggles that his dad went to try to fight Vaught, they just gave this man the biggest shaft and made him just a stereotypical black man. They did some cool stuff with like Oh, the hip hop t shirts. They did some cool things with him being this defender, like giving him the job to be um the one to take Becca to the, the, the CIA. But that moment as well, they tell they told him to leave the fight, even though you had the, 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 the you were the best person to help combat these soups with your shotgun in hand. You are going to leave this fight and be the defender of this wife and kid. And I was like that's a little suspect. Why are you shoving Mother's Milk to the side? Mother's Milk, one of the best characters and the most compelling characters in the show. Like, they finally gave him the ability to go home and see his kids, but I'm just like, why? why? Honestly, go ahead. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you up until that last part where they trusted him with Becca. Okay. Mother's Milk is the family man of the group. Mm-hmm. So he, it, it makes more sense to me for Mother's Milk to take them than Butcher. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And Butcher knew that too, because if if Homelander saw Butcher, he'd stop immediately to kill Butcher and Huey, and probably forget to go after the car. Yeah. And Which al- I think that was the idea. Yeah. And also the one thing, and, and while I agree, and we'll talk about the the friggin' um, the, the girls do it better shit in a, in a minute, because um, I know Mary has a list of points on that. <laughs> um, I have a lot to say. Um. I think what would have been really clean was we we obviously A Train couldn't couldn't have got a smack in on Stormfront, but what have, what it would have been really clean is if Mother of Milk got a, got the punch Stormfront, and they didn't let him do it, especially because of what happened to that one black family. If Mother's Milk could have smacked the shit out of Stormfront, that would have been a glorious ass scene. Even if she pile dried him across the lane and they made Stormfront say the N-word or some crazy shit. Like, that would have been a really cool scene that we didn't get and I'm sad about. 
Like, that could have been a really powerful moment for M.M., and they didn't do it. And I'm like, why? But the scene we got was still amazing, and I'm like, all right. So, I think Mother's Book got the biggest shaft this season. But, and then Frenchie got the most, so much development. I love what they did with him. Huey, Huey's an interesting case. Um, Huey's one of those people that it's like, why, why are you, like, so lovable, but I want to punch you in the throat? Um, but I want to back up, because I'm doing this weird, because I'm having us, each person, like, go through, like, the subsections of this, but I think it would be better if we just talk about this in general. Let me back up. How do we feel about Butcher's development this season? I, I, anybody can jump in here, because I, I want to, like, mix this up a little bit better. I, like... I said this on Twitter. I am strangely just proud of him. Like that last episode, like the episode, episode four, where he snuck into the compound and tried to rescue Becca. He was being like, yeah, sure. Ryan can come along. And I'm like, at first I was like, oh, that's nice. And then I'm like, oh, wait, no, he doesn't really mean that. And then the end of the episode was him just, being like, yeah, no, I want to get rid of him. He's a fucking and then with, soup. Yeah. <laughs> and then episode eight, uh, he makes the deal again at first. He's like, no, don't worry, I'll find your son. And then he goes to Edgar and he's like, uh, give me my wife back, I'll give you the kid, and just get him a new mom. And then, like, he saw, like, Becca consoling Ryan, and he was genuinely just like, I can't do it. And he admits everything. And like, he tries to like, before the thing happens, like when Stormfront tries to get to Ryan again, he like, he, I think he says like, not on your life or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, like, then when uh, Ryan uh, killed, well, not killed Stormfront, because she's not dead. She's not dead. She can't be dead. (laughs) Uh, she's gonna be like Darth Vader in in a future season. Darth Nazi. Darth, I mean, it makes sense. And the Empire was basically the Nazi regime, but uh, like you see, like when Becca died, and she was just pleading to him, like it's not his fault. He's good. Promise me you'll keep him safe. And you see, like the anger in Butcher's eyes. I'm like, don't do it. Like, don't like. It's a kid. He's literally crying his eyes out right now. What you do right now will decide what kind of person he's going to become. And then I think when Homelander came in, it and Ryan started to go over towards Butcher. I think that's when he really realized this is not. It's it's not. It's all Homelander. Mm -hmm. Like this is all him. It's and just that. Like when he just says like. When when Homelander's like, you're gonna protect the kid who murdered your wife, Homelander just take like not home <laughs> Butcher takes a moment and he's like, I promised. I'm like, Ugh. and then the last thing he says to Ryan before Ryan goes off God knows where, <laughs> that that last piece of advice really just God but also all the stuff with Huey and uh how they said he's Huey is like Lenny, Lenny who uh, we find out was Butcher's younger brother, who basically was like the dog whisperer for him, uh, just like always able to calm him down. And unfortunately, you know, I think they said he killed himself. Yeah, he right? shot himself. Yeah. Um, so, like, I just, I really like the development between, with his relationship with uh, Huey, especially, like, I mean, I haven't read the comic, but I know where it goes and what happens at the end between them, and I'm just like, I, like, they could do that, and it could be very emotional, but, like, I kind of don't want that, um, but, uh, yeah, no, Butcher, like, his development this season was phenomenal, and... I hope they keep it up. Um, he yep. could very well regress, but yeah. Um, were we just talking about Butcher? I yeah, just Butcher right forgot. there. Um, okay. You're good. Uh, Mary, do you have any thoughts on Butcher before we move on? 
I do. I've just got a couple. Go for um, it. I, I do think it's interesting because it all ties back into Ryan that, you know, what kind of a man is Ryan going to be? And I don't think Butcher fundamentally as a person has changed. I think he just did the right thing. Mm. Because he's not going to magically shift to being this morally upright, you know, upstanding kind of a guy. And, you know, to be honest, nobody wants him to be. You know, we kind of like the grungy anti-hero thing. Yeah. But I think... I think his whole conflict with Ryan, it boiled down to jealousy. I think if you if you strip everything away, it boils down to jealousy. Because the moment that we see his face change is when Ryan is like, who is that? And Becca, without hesitation, says, that's my husband. And you see that look go over his face. And he realizes that Becca has not forgotten him. Mm-hmm. That you know, it's about both of them. That she wants to be with her husband, but she can't leave her son. And I think he realized that for once he has not been left behind is that you know mm-hmm. lenny lenny killed himself and he was alone um you know because he's kind of gone from anchor point to anchor point because first it was his brother and then it was becca and now it's kind of transitioning to huey so i think for the first time butcher finally realized that he was not left behind mm-hmm. and once he realized that he knew to do the right thing i mean i can't say any of us wouldn't have issues with like a Ryan situation if you kind of get what I'm going with here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't I don't know if anybody can say how they would react in that kind of a situation, but I, I think know. when he realized that it wasn't Ryan or him, it was she desperately wanted to protect both of them. Yeah. And um, I grew up Catholic, and so St. Christopher medals are this, they're this big thing. And a St. Christopher medal is very, um, it, it, it's very specific because um, it is something that you wear to protect yourself. You have your St. Christopher medals in a scapular. And that is, it, it's not some like flowery, oh, this is going to protect you. It's like, no, that is what that medal is for, is, you know, to kind of help keep you safe. Yeah. And, depending upon who gives them to you, obviously it's a very precious keepsake. And so, you know, kind of giving that to Ryan, he's making sure that Ryan does not get left behind. That he's giving over, you know, let's, you know, if we're, if we're, if we want to get poetic with this, it's the one thing of Becca that he had that he held dear and he's giving that to Ryan. So Ryan does not feel left behind. Mm, Yeah. I think that's just my thing with Butcher is that in a sense, almost accepting what humanity and empathy and, you know, these kinds of things is he promised. That was beautiful. So. Um, does any, does anyone else want to speak on Mother's Milk? Cause I know me and Travis touched on that, but like, do either, either of y'all I want, agree with our point? I, I, want, I, want, I want to talk about Butcher. Go ahead, Butcher, go ahead. Um, see, I, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna come out and crass as fuck with it. I liked Butcher because, like, to touch back on what Mary said, um, how he kind of was teaching Ryan how not to be that whole "don't be a cunt" moment. Yes, that was, was beautiful. Absolutely, my favorite part of the whole fucking season because yeah. to 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 Butcher, everyone except Becca is a cunt. Everyone. It doesn't matter who you are, you know, fucking, you got, uh, Homelander's a soup cunt, you got A-Train, he's a fast cunt, you got Stormfront, who's a chick cunt. It, it's wild. I don't understand it, but it makes sense from when Butcher says it. The way he uses that word, and the, because uh, Butcher himself is honestly the biggest cunt of the show. Yes. That's undeniable. And so when, when he's sitting down with Ryan, and he gives him the St. Christopher medal, it's for once butcher is a human because before that it was all about getting becca i don't care the cost i don't care who i hurt it doesn't matter i want becca back period but as soon as she was like yo make sure he doesn't know make sure he knows it's not his fault and keep him safe he was like well this is what everything has led me up to and he not only slam dunked it but he dribbled it back down court and dunked it a second time with that whole don't be a cunt thing. He like passed on 
a little bit of knowledge in Butcher's fun, quirky way, but it was also pretty pure, considering it's like, it's how like he passed the on the cunt immunity from Becca to Ryan. It like the cunt immunity just <laughs> right. transfers. I mean... <laughs> <laughs> exactly that. Like, okay. Um, does anyone, else, Alec, Mary, do you guys want to speak on Mother's Milk before we move on? Because I want to talk about Kimiko. Because that that girl. Oh. Um, I just want to say one. I just want to say one thing. I have no problems with the use of the word. All right. Fair enough. Oh, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just sitting here. I'm just sitting here, and I'm listening. You know, I'm listening to Travis talk, and I'm like, somebody is going to listen to this and think that I am offended. I, I'm not. I just want to put that out there. I am yeah. not going to lie. As soon as I said Stormfront, I was like, ah, no. Like, we're, 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 we're holding Mary at gunpoint. You're not. We're allowed to say con. It's a reference. Like, no. Like, we, 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 we're doing this on purpose, damn it. We mean this in the strictly Australian. <laughs> Australian sense, Australian. like Billy Butcher. Yes. Um, so no, I just wanted, I just wanted that to be. Said. I don't want someone to okay. listen to this and think that I'm. No, 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 no I am fine. <laughs> Do you have a mother's milk thoughts? Um, I think I kind of like tied to, to kind of like Buttress Travis's point a little bit. I think that. I definitely see where you where you're coming in that he feels sidelined because I think he had more to do in season one than he did in season two. Yes, but I think it I think it kind of goes back to something that MM said when Becca first gets there and they're all crowding around her is that Billy doesn't get close with anybody and he means that very sincerely, but for Billy to trust you know Mother's Milk with the single most important most important person on planet Earth to him. I think that was kind of saying, look, I trust you. I trust you more than anyone here. I am trusting you with my wife that I have, you know, taken you from your family, you know, kind of a thing. Like you have pledged yourself, I'm using air quotes here, to my cause. And I want you to know that that is reciprocated. I am trusting you to get her out of here because you understand. And I think if anybody understands what Butcher is feeling, it is MM. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I, I think exactly it's kind him. of... A, it's kind of a double-edged sword because I absolutely do see that he got sidelined and Victoria even said something similar, but I think it's one of those, it's an emotional action as opposed to a physical one. Yeah. And I think the best moment is like, I think why, um, mother's milk is like butcher's best friend, but Huey is his brother because you have that moment where, um, Huey's like, bitch, you're not leaving this house. And uh, Butcher's like, you really think you're gonna stop me? And, and Mother's Milk leans over the, 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 like the wall and goes, you may get through him, but you're not going through me. And that was that moment where it hit me, where it was like, Mother's Milk is the best friend, Huey is the brother. Like, that was probably one of my favorite moments the entire season, because I was like, damn. <laughs> Something to tie back with what you said, James, is the whole, you know, you wanted um, Mother's Milk to get a punch in with Stormfront. Mm -hmm. I'm in a sense glad that he didn't, because narratively it would not have made sense. Because let's go back, what is it, episode two or episode three, where we see Stormfront rip through that apartment building. I think it was three. It was three, because it was the final episode of that little chunk. Yeah. Um, First of all, that scene is horrifically terrifying. All of the credit in the world to Aya Cash. She played this role beautifully. Yes. There there was not a second of her screen time that I didn't believe anything Stormfront was, you know, uh, that I did not believe, you know, from the kid. Because, you, you know, sometimes actors will kind of go out of character a little bit. She committed herself to a very difficult role because yes. this role would probably be hard for, you know, hard for most people. Mm-hmm. And she committed herself to it and kind of that, that, that soulless look in her eyes. That's a very hard thing to emote i found myself genuinely afraid of her and that scene is one of them because just the pure disregard for human life i like how we're covering some of the other superheroes while we're also (laughs) sorry sorry no i'm saying this is good things that way we want to keep cross going back and forth i can like cross off my tallies while we're going about this can i say one thing about oh sorry i didn't know you sorry go ahead no no no. go go ahead one thing I wanted to say about MM is that I love the development between I love the development of his relationship with Huey, especially yes. in the first few episodes. Like the ep, the scene in episode one where Huey's like, "You've been looking at me like you wanted to kick my ass all day, so just do it." And he's just like, "I don't want to kick your ass. I just want my family back." Like, I love that moment. 
Yeah. Also, when he hugged Huey, when he got Compound V, that was beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, I, I, I do want to agree with you about storefront. Cause like this role and here's the thing okay. they could have easily, Oh, go ahead. I finish. I just wanted to finish my point. Oh yeah. Go for it. Go for it. But, um, it, it's just cause you know, she rips through the apartment building and it's the apartment building is full of black people and she mows through them in a truly horrifying fashion. The scene is terrifying, but it's so well done. It's one of those, you know, it genuinely makes you uncomfortable. And I think that's something that honestly gets lost when we talk about Nazi slash modern day Nazi slash white supremacist narratives is that you're so caught up in the shock value of Nazism that you lose the genuine horror that is white supremacy. Yes. But putting mother's milk in close proximity to Stormfront, she would not have hesitated to kill him. That's fair. Because we see him because we have Kimiko's brother and then she snaps uh, Kimiko's neck like nobody's business. I think if she, if Mother's Milk had been in too close proximity to her, she would have killed him without hesitation. And I think narratively, it would not have made sense at that point. That's valid. Um, I think, like, Stormfront could have went ass backwards really fast. And I'm grateful the writers didn't do it. Because there could have, like, when she was keeping up the persona and was like, trying to defy the whole girls do it better thing and she was trying to be like who the fuck cares what like who, who does what like let's just get the job done and she was like try, basically being i i want i want to i want to like word this the right way i think like what 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 the neckbeards perceive captain like captain marvel to be of like this ultra feminist that doesn't give a fuck about men thing like how they perceive the movie um I, I love that they could have easily just kept pushing that idea of she's what the neckbeards want. And in reality, she like she went over and ultra on top of it. She like she went to the point that she was the white supremacist. She could have just been the anti feminist that they want, but instead she became this horrible white supremacist where she didn't give a fuck about anybody. She only cared about the dominant race to the point that she even said that shit to Ryan. When she said that shit to Ryan, I was like, yo, this got really dark, really motherfucking quick on top of the darkness we already had. And as shitty as Homelander is, I gotta give him his credit because he was kind of disgusted with the white supremacist talking points. Yeah. <laughs> he was like, all right, all right. Oh, like, Ryan, just like, be mad. Don't be like that. Be like mad. And I was like, damn, even Homelander gets it. Like, the way he right. was looking at her, he's just like, what the fuck are you talking about? That, <laughs> like, I, I am so anti-social in terms of, like, I do not understand people at all. And even I know that that is not fucking true. Like, I only care about America. I love every American, and I just want to rule them bitches. You want to, like, kill, like, 70 to 90 percent of them. That's a little Which fucked is- up. <laughs> Oh Which is kind of a funny parallel to think about when when the Ubermensch is disgusted with this fucking ideology. The ideology is critically flawed. Homelander does not discriminate on who he murders. Thank you very much. Yeah, no. Like there, there was that whole moment in the house at the end of the season where he was like, "Where's my motherfucking son?" And also they killed the black man first. That's bullshit. But anyway, but like he, they killed everybody in the room, and I was like, "Damn, he doesn't give what? a fuck." It's one of those crossovers. It's one of the, the old DC Marvel crossovers where Joker and Red Skull get, end up having mm. to tussle each other. And mm-hmm. Joker is horrified when he finds out Red Skull is a Nazi. And he's like, I may be a criminal psychopath, but I am an American criminal psychopath. Yeah, like Joker kills everybody. He don't give a fuck who you are. <laughs> to be so fair, I think funny. Joker now would be like, does this mean we get to kill more people? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah that, that'd be hilarious. But no, nah, um, so before we move on to the soups, and, like, I think the best way to cap off Frenchie is just Frenchie got the, got the development he needed. It explained yeah. what happened with Lamplighter. And, like, like that's, that's pretty much what we can do with that is just Frenchie got the development he needed. Otherwise, he was just going to keep being a dumb stereotype and I would have been irritated for too damn long. Like, and he got very legitimate bisexual representation. Yes! You yeah. are very correct. legitimate. And what's hilarious is you go from what like the the great bisexual representation to then having the horrible bi erasure that was happening with May. 
Oh god, they they captured the whole narrative so beautiful. Okay, we'll have to talk about that later. Yeah, we have maybe a whole damn category or so. Jesus Christ, but um, but no. So like, that's the easy way to cap off Frenchie is that like he got the development he needed. Kimiko. <laughs> yeah, uh, I fucking stand. I need this actress to be adult Cass Kane in whatever DC movie they could put her in. Please. No, man. They, she, she, was they, Katana. she was Katana. She was Katana. I know, but Suicide Squad was ass. Yeah, but like they, they've already, they've already admitted they're not Here's afraid to put, bring people back so they can have her come back as Katana. Something uh, I would say. Oh, sorry. I just want to say, someday, Karen Fukuhara will have an on-screen role that lets her talk. <laughs> The, but, only time, right? the only time in recent memory we've gotten to hear what she sounds like it's is Shira. Shira because she was Glimmer. Like, she emotes so powerfully. She's Glimmer? Yeah, she's Glimmer. Holy Glimmer. shit. <laughs> you didn't know that? <laughs> no, you just blew my fucking mind. <laughs> That's actually relatively close to her natural speaking voice, too. That's one. And, like I watch I her YouTube that. channel, and she's so fucking sweet, dude. And like you watch her in this yeah. show. Oh, go ahead, Mary. There's a there's a there's a deleted scene from Suicide Squad where Harley Quinn gets up in her face, and she's all like, "Oh, you're wearing a mask because you're hiding and doing your psychobabble bullshit." And she takes the mask off, and she looks at Harley Quinn kind of like with like a Kimiko expression, and says, "I'm not hiding." And like it's just they should have put that in the movie mm. and like she needs a role where they let her talk like they ch- Warner ch- Brothers should be at her door right now being like please come back we're oh, sorry <laughs> but no we like were... she is perfect. she's perfect casting for Katana yes is that a cat? Um, there's a cat somewhere yeah it's it's, oh, it's my, my cat um, okay I'm sorry I thought I was going crazy one but thing I want to say go ahead. One thing... before I go in go ahead Okay, uh, sorry to be a weeb on Maine. Have any of you seen Evangelion? Yes. Of yes. course. She would be, like, okay, fuck live-action anime adaptations, but she, if if they had to make one, she would be the perfect, she would be the perfect Misato. Mm. Oh, oh that's not where God. I thought you were going with that. What'd you think I was gonna say? I thought you were gonna say Asuka. Oh, no, like, she's too old, I think. But no, yeah. um, I think like like Karen Fukuhara emotes so powerfully to the point that I just love her so much. Like, okay, but hear me out. Hear me out. So, Karen Fukuhara's katana duking it out with Lucy Liu's Lady Shiva. Hear me out. Oh, uh, uh, that would be just the uh, most beautiful scene. Oh, Travis is like having a having a painful orgasm or in even- the corner. <laughs> I'll even I'll even take I will even take Constance Wu's Lady Sheba. Ooh, oh. Ooh. And just the next snap. God, she just yeah, her neck and Wu. throws her on a meat Ooh. hook and leaves. I need it. Oh, I need but, it so much. Um, but no. So yeah, I definitely want. I I I want to interview her one day because Karen Fukuhara deserves so much credit. She emotes so powerfully with like the made up sign language that it's just like damn. And even though her brother was only there for two episodes, that, like, that bond. And then finally, when Frenchie um, and her connect again, after, like, like his first, he, like, he, was, he, was, he was high and drunk. He kissed her. That was fucked up. Then, later on, and she wanted to kiss him, I was like, honey, no, don't do this. Like, just be best friends. Like, just, like, like don't, ha- you don't have to lean on him like that if you don't want to. And it was just like, if they do it, cool. If they don't, like, I would prefer that because I would like to see her just be this independent, strong woman that's ro- rose above what she's been through and not have to lean on Frenchie who's just trying to, like, fix her. Like, that, like, but I see with the ending that they're probably going to end up together. At least they're better off than what they were when he kissed her. I was like, oh. I oh. spent all of season two looking at Victoria going, I don't know if I ship this. I like it, but I don't like yeah. it. I'm, I'm genuinely middle of the road. Like, I think I, now, I'll ship like it, James but I'd be said, okay with it. Like, if they did it now, like what James <laughs> said, after all this development, oh, yeah, I think no, it would be a lot better. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so the, the Karen Fukuhara, you are welcome on this show anytime. You have earned your, your panel to panel card. Um, please <laughs> come on the show. <laughs> but nah, um, so I, I think, promise I won't go too hard about Shira, even though I will go too hard about Shira. Um, right. 
but no, <laughs> it's the um, Travis you saw it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, so we so from here we're gonna move on to the soups. I'm gonna start. We're gonna start with with the lessers and then move on to the big ones. I think um, we've already covered Stormfront pretty con- like condensively, but so like to the point that anything else will be towards the themes of the show because there's a lot of themes like what what Mary wants to talk about and what we want to get into. This so, might be a lengthy episode. <laughs> oh, you know, this, this will be close to. Well, usually we go about an hour and a half. We're gonna be like close to two hours this one, um, which would be cool because like after this we have just like streamlined episodes planned till December, which is fine. Um, so deep. I want to. <laughs> I, I want to get this one done I really have, quick. Oof. Oof. The I... reason why I say that, and I'm gonna go first on this one because I have a really passionate hatred and I want to do everything in my power to ruin the Church of Scientology. So for them to do what they did with Deep, I was like, because when when season one came and like they did the whole switcheroo of having the girl like violate his gills, A, his gills make me uncomfortable. Like, like y'all could have found some other way to illustrate them gills. You could have did what they do with Aqualad in the comics and put them on his neck. Y'all didn't have to make it his whole fucking, like, 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 like abdominal muscles. That is uncomfortable. We should probably, I have woman things to say about this. We should probably lay down a content warning that yes. sensitive themes will be discussed in this section. So maybe skip ahead a couple of minutes. Yeah, like, Deep is a, is a, is a rough one, like, especially with the like the content warning they should have put in episode one of season one. I think Deep is just a content warning in general. And also, to, to, the, to, to the gay bear community on Facebook, F all of y'all for trying to simp for Deep over the stupid Amazon calendar covers because... He's their favorite twink, bro. No, Huey is the favorite twink. It may have even said he's a fucking twink. But anyway. Um, That's true. Yeah, maybe even happen. said he's a wait, fucking wait, we twink. Skipped over, we skipped over Huey. Huey's, Huey's more theme-based for me. I, like, because, okay, that that's reasonable. Yeah, Huey's Huey definitely more theme-based. But no, um, when it comes to the deep, I think the only way I would have taken him not just murdered by Homelander on, like, off-screen would have been this. Br- like, trying to shoot Scientology in the fucking face. Like, that was the best way you could have did it. Um, I don't know what y'all's obsession with Fresca is. But that shit is nasty. What the hell is wrong with y'all? That is not okay. But um, it's worse, Sprite. I, I, yeah, it's worse, Sprite. But like, I also Pat Oswald. I love you with every fiber of my being. But you made me uncomfortable. You <laughs> made me hell on because during their panel it, during the summer, he said, "I have a guest role in the show." I, and it, it, it wasn't what I expected, but I have a guest role in the show. And then what they do with it, I was like, "Nope, nope, nope." I, I kept fast forwarding. I kept hitting the ten second fast forward because I was like, "No, no, this is uncomfortable." And then they came back to it, and I was like, "No, no, this is uncomfortable." And it's just oh, it kept going. Um, I feel so bad for Eagle. Like black green arrow knockoff dude, like that man did not deserve to be involved in Scientology. He didn't deserve that. But I, I wanted to see more of his story. But in terms of deep, I think they kind of just benched him the entirety of the season. Like I, I, that's why I agree with Alec. They kind of sidelined him. But oh what, no, they didn't. No, like what I see, what I mean by sideline is they did enough with him because I think they want to do something more with him in season three. But they gave yeah. him a side plot to hold him off. That way he wasn't involved with, like, Maeve and Starlight and causing more drama. But they gave him this side plot. That way he could still be involved for when Maeve needed what she needed. And I love what they did with it. Um, Mary, you want to talk about Deep. I'm going to let you talk about Deep because I think everyone else will involve their uh, opinions based off of what you say. So I'm going to let you have, have the stage on this one. Um, I'm about to torpedo everything you just said, by the way. Oh, really? Oh, let's go. I'm I'm down for it. He was in no way sidelined. Okay. In, in no way was he sidelined because I have, I had a very visceral reaction to that storyline as I'm sure most women did because and the fact that they, again, if you did not catch our first content warning, this will be genuinely uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So skip ahead a couple minutes. Um, the fact that they toned down the sexual assault in season one. Like, that that blows my mind, because in the comic books, it's A-Train, Homelander, and Black Noir. He's ironically not involved with it. 
Yeah. But the one thing is that, um, sorry, I always get a little, like I said, it's hard for women not to, a lot of women, I don't want to say all women, but a lot of women to not have a visceral reaction to the storyline. And I, I think it kind of ties into what James just said a little bit is that once the me tooing is done and they've been pushed out of the spotlight, bing, bang, boom, it's over, it's done. That's not the case, though, because what they're poking at and something I want to talk about a little later is that there are a lot of women behind the camera on the boys. Um, you know, so a handful of, I, I think, three episodes in season two are written by women. And that's almost half the season. And then there are several female directors. So what they're doing is they're taking this and they're, you know, kind of deconstructing the journey that men go through that, you know, certain men, I'm obviously not all men thing, but that certain men go through <clears throat> when, you know, very famous and powerful men, what they go through when they essentially get away with assaulting women like that. And that's so much of what his storyline dealt with that it's easy to look at it and go, oh, you know, it's over, he's sidelined, he's benched, nothing's happening. That's very much not true. A lot was happening there because he gets, he, he doesn't get punished, he doesn't get arrested, anything like that, he gets moved. Yep. And that, that happens a lot and it's so easily, you know, looked over that you realize that he's still doing shit. He still gets to be a soup. He still gets to have a job. You know, they're just trying to push him out of the way to cover him up. And he lost his big fancy job, but he still has a job kind of a thing. And right. he got shuffled around like a Catholic priest. That's what I was saying. That, that Catholic church's ass. They, they threw him mm -hmm. to the side like, you ain't a problem, but you can still get your money. But that's, that's everywhere. And, you know, I was, I was assaulted by a woman. So that's, you know, I, I can't talk, I can't speak to women that have been assaulted by men, but especially women that have been assaulted by men in professional settings. Companies don't fire them. They, sometimes they do if it's public enough, but they get shuffled, they get moved, they get taken out of their position of power and given these really expensive golden parachutes. So it's putting forward something that women are all, that, you know, not even women, but like, you know, victims are all too familiar with. And the fact that it is kind of so effectively looked at as being benched or that's over or that's just so indicative of how well they were able to write it realistically. That, you know, in his search for quote unquote redemption, he has to turn to something as insane as Scientology because they're the only ones that will give him a chance. Yeah. And it's just, like I said, it's a very visceral storyline that I think worked. It, it did work as a solid B-plot, but I don't think in any way was the deep benched. That this is... I think it all boils down to privilege, believe it or not. That he Male gets to... Privilege. Imagine if the deep was a black man. Or, mm. uh, or, you know, an Asian man. Or, you know, a person of color. He would not be given these chances. And I think it's just kind of speaking to, you know, not only white privilege, but male privilege, don't come at me. But, you know, it's in these different things. And so it's, it still remains a very visceral storyline that, yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm spiraling at this point. No, but, you're, you're yeah. making very good points. I, I think what I meant more by sidelined is promotion material made it really seem like Deep was just going to be back on the seven. And it gave me this vibe that they were going to throw him back on. It wasn't going to be beef. But in the end, they just left him on the, set, like the, the, the side of the road. They left him there. And we don't know what's going to happen with Deep. We don't know what he's going to do. A-Train got back on the 7, but now like we're entering another chapter, similar with Homelander, where Homelander has... And we'll talk about Homelander, Jesus Christ, in a second. But um, Homelander has crossed the... Ab oh, the Deep has crossed the avenue where he went from trying to be um, redeemed and to now, what can he possibly go from here? And yeah, Maeve said, hey, you want to get back on the 7? I'll help you if you do this thing for me. But Maeve don't got that much power. She doesn't. Like, Esposito may, like, give her a bone here and there, but, like, there's not much she can do. So, I really feel as if the Deep, 
like was very much sidelined with no hope for what comes next but they're definitely going to do something with them because it's obvious they have a plan so i that's why that's what i meant more by sidelined he had a great story and now they're doing something with him but like i ugh, the gills you it was so uncomfortable. So no, don't send that shit. Don't send, <laughs> that song was ruined for me by that that shit. Um, moving on from the deep, uh, Alec, do you want to comment on the deep before we move forward? I just want to say uh, Chase Crawford just completely sells this absolute fucking deplorable loser. Oh god, Agreed. absolutely, absolutely. I honestly don't think there's a bad performance in the whole show. Agreed. Oh, no. Travis, do you want to comment on the deep before we move on? I I'm just gonna say I love how Eagle fucking drugged him. That shit was funny, <laughs> right? Like that was <laughs> some true. It, it dog. reminded What's me of that scene. It reminded me of that scene from It Chapter Two, where where Mike just gives James McAvoy the root, and he's like, "What the fuck? You drugged me?" <laughs> I love that shit. He's like, "Hey man, are you gonna trip with me?" And he goes, "Nah, deep. This is your journey. This is your like, journey." Ooh, he fucking got your ass, motherfucker. It's like, I've been through that shit. This is your journey. I'm like, damn. I, I wanna... And then Pat and Oswald hit him with the fucking, you violated her before she could violate you. I was like, ooh, he gonna cry now. It's ooh, time. It's like, time. Uh, it, was, I, I, it made me so uncomfortable. Just like, because if it was like, oh, um, Pat and Oswald was just like, like, like a random voice in his head or some shit, or like was a dolphin or something, that would have been fine. They made his gills flap. I was like, that's uncomfortable. I don't want to see that. And which goes into, like, like ironically enough, Deep, Deep's entire theme of everyone thinks his body's ugly, but, like, fucking A, dude. You could have... Anyway. Um, Honestly, my favorite, like, like, so when, when after he got drugged, and my, my other favorite part of that shit was when Homelander came up to him and gave him the exact shit that males give women all the fucking time where he's like, yo, deep, cover that shit up. It's disgusting. Ooh, yeah, you're right. I, I may have, like, viscerally enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, I was a big fan of that shit. I was like, fuck yeah, the one time Homelander is, well, still a piece of shit, just to another piece of shit. So it's yeah. Um. So from there, um, I, I'm, I'm not giving him his own section, but but, but Black Noir see, like ceases like does not cease to crack me up. That man is just like funny as hell. And then to come to find out he had a nut allergy just made it even more hilarious. So Black Noir gets points for just being the funniest silent man on the show. Um, and like I just, we- I just loved how they made his his weakness as mundane as Bruce Wayne truly is, right? And like they <laughs> like it, it, I really am like I'm glad they didn't move the pedophilia, but they gave it a nod. I was like, you didn't do it, but thank you for not doing it. I was like, good job. You, you kept you kept it in your pants. Good job, because because if you read the the boys comic book, Black Noir is a fucking pedophile. And it's like, it sucks. So for them to just vaguely give it a nod and then walk out the door, I was like, good job. I feel like Will Smith and Hancock, good job. Like, that's how I feel about that shit. Um, I'm going to say, Black Noir, we got deep. Um, A-Train. A-Train's a weird one. Because I thought A Train was gonna get benched like 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 harder than he he did. I thought A Train was gonna just be done the rest of the season, and then randomly you know, they go, no, he got j- j- jacked up on Compound V to the point that he exited a coma. And I'm like, what? That man was in a fucking coma. What the fuck? Like I thought they were gonna have him just be all of season two and then come back in season three. Yeah, that's not, yeah, like, that, that oh, made more sense to me. So, so it's just like the like, like I, I figure like season three he'll come back he'll do some moves whatever and then they're like nah I'm cracked up on this shit my heart's about to explode but I'm still going I'm like wait a minute hold on I think I think they needed a target for Stormfront's blatant racism mm, yeah yeah because she can mouth off to A Train in a way that she can't necessarily mouth off to Edgar yeah that's yeah. very true so I think. I think of anything she needed, the the story demanded a more consistent target for her more blatant, I'm using air quotes here, racism. Yeah. So A-Train, I, I, there's not a whole lot you can say about him. Travis, what were you going to say? I'm sorry. Um, honestly, like A-Train, I, there were a few moments I thought they were kind of fucking funny and also stupid. That That's what they were funny for was the like, 
when he was playing Prince's guitar. And he was like, you know, I just figured I want that shit. So I said, fuck it. Because honestly, it's that same, it's that Homelander mentality kind of rubbing off on A-Train. Like, yeah. who but Homelander is going to stop A-Train? Fucking nobody, honestly. And so, like, another thing I really, honestly, very much enjoyed about A-Train was that he kind of reminded the audience that he's a black man first. You know what I'm yep. saying? Like, he risked it all to fuck over Stormfront. And then he was successful with it. <laughs> it was just like a... Fuck yeah! He was like, fuck that Nazi serious? bitch. I was like, fuck yes. Fuck yeah! <laughs> um, so A-Train's definitely one of those where it's just like cut and dry. He did what he needed to do. But I'm, I'm like, I, I honestly was just surprised he was even here. Um, Wait, can I say? Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, um, so in season one, A-Train was like my favorite of the antagonists. Especially because of the, the dynamic between him and Huey. Especially near the end where he just kept placing all the blame on Huey. And in some cases, he was right. And in other cases, he just would not take responsibility for anything with Robin and all. Um, but also, he is just such an interesting character, especially with the relationship he had with his brother. Uh, that one scene uh, after he got his fucking femur broken, which, yeah. God, I, I cannot <laughs> imagine how much I, I still love that scene because Kimiko was just like, bitch! <laughs> But like that scene when he was in the uh, the um, shoe store and the cop was racially profiling him, mm. and the, until like everybody was like, "Yo, that's A Train," and then the cop tried to act all friendly and he's like, "Get the fuck away from me!" And like in this season, I was like looking forward to oh, Alec. seeing what they were doing with him this season, and he didn't do as much as I wanted to see. Um, I did th- I did think that one part was interesting after. Uh, uh, Starlight leaked uh, the compound of the info, and he's like, "What did you do?" And she's like, "I did the right thing." And he's like, "And he's like, we're gonna lose all of our money, everything." And she's like, "There's more important things." And then he's like, "The only people are say that the only people who say that are the ones who had money to begin with." That's and, true. And it leads me to I want to find out more about, and that, but I wish, and that also goes into that. um what uh what was said during the talks with Sci- the Scientology dude where they said, oh yeah, no, they're, they're going to give Shockwave your name and your suit. It, like no one cares about a random dude from the South side of Chicago. Like that stuck with me was that like you really, like, there's a story with A-Train they really want to tell, but they can't. And I was like, damn. I hope they tell it in season three because they could have easily told it this season, but they just chose not to. But uh, I did like, uh, in the last episode, the scene with him, Huey, and Starlight, where he, like, like he and Huey didn't really have any hate towards each other anymore. Mm-hmm. And, like, I kind of, like, want to weirdly see them work together in, like, future seasons. Also, just, like, just him being like, I want back in, so I need her gone. Fuck that Nazi bitch. And I'm just, like, <laughs> bounced. Cute. I, I love that. But uh, I hope I really hope we get more of him next season because I was I was just like missing him a lot. I missed how he was in season one where he was just like both the both like one of the scummiest, but also one of the most like realistic characters of yeah. the show. Um. So from there, I think the 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 dual we, the dual wielding lightsaber, as it were, that can be talked about, which is Huey and and, and Annie. I think they both mm-hmm. coincide. So I, I want to make sure we talked about them together. And this kind of goes into the theme discussions. We're going to like slowly transition from to, into the theme discussions here. Because Maeve is a theme. Her entire arc is a damn theme. I thought that Mary's <laughs> laughing because she knows I'm right. Um, but but Huey and Annie sort of just kind of like coincide together. Um, I think that these two are like... Well, well, he was drastically different from what he was, like, in the comic, from what I've been told by Mary, because I still haven't read this damn book. I've only read volume one. But from what I've seen and from what Mary has told me, that he was drastically different. But from what I've seen of him, I see a little bit of myself and, like, the issues that I've had with my own mother. And I see this this kid who, like, who really just doesn't want to give up on the world no matter how fucked up it got, and to the point that it got fucked up to him to the point that he ended up literally getting inside of a whale. And he was just like, 
you know, I'm done. What's the straight up mental <laughs> breakdown? Like, you guys go, I'm cool. Like, it, it's over. Here. I'm done. I'm that not, whole I'm episode with me, that whole episode, like, hit a chord with me with him because he was just like so prepared to just give up and die, and like, I, 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 I don't know. I just that whole episode for me was just great. <laughs> Yeah. Honestly, that was probably my favorite part with Mother's Milk too. He just gets back in the whale. He's like, "I'm, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. You done? I'm done too." I'm like, "Damn!" Right? We we done together, and he was like, "Really, motherfucker?" He goes, "Yeah, nigga, let's go." Like, like we done. <laughs> but no, when, when it comes from that, and, oh, go ahead, man. I'll let you go. I was just gonna say that um, I think that that's actually kind of the whole point of Huey's character is that he's a self insert. That and. It, he, he's a self-insert in the comic book, but more for Garth Innes than anybody else. But in the TV show, he he's a self-insert for the viewer. There is at least one aspect of Huey's character that most people identify with, be it the anxiety or, you know, the completely in over your headedness mm. of all of that. Even down to the, you have an idea of what's right and what's wrong. And you're going to, you know, you're going to take that severed hand and you're going to go try and free your girlfriend's mom with it. Like... So Huey is the example of a self-insert character done right. Yeah. I still think he needs throw a punch, though. Yes, he does. Especially he when he, like, ended up at Old Girl's <laughs> office. I was like, yeah, you need throw a punch. But that's the whole point, is that most people need throw punched at least once in their life. <laughs> yeah. Um... I also wouldn't want to sit and watch porn with Iceman either, if you... And what's crazy is the creator said they filmed like full fucking pornos and they he wants to release them to the public. And I was like, do it. Like really? Do it. Really? Like did y'all do that much? Like really? That's just excessive for no reason. I I love that one line when he and when he and Ice Man were getting he's like, all right, let's go fuck the wife. Uh, consensually. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> but like there's okay. that, that that whole moment right there where like Iceman just is like nah you're worse than the cuck like I was like damn really you you could go lower than the cuck really like that's too much like you're the cuck floor. like that's too much so in general um H- Huey's arc is beautiful and I love how it compliments Annie because Annie goes through her own fucking struggles this season <laughs> where it's like she's just she's she had to literally embrace the like the over sexy starlight persona and go deep undercover. And I feel for her because she didn't want to do that shit to the point that she puts on her old costume at the end of the season. And it's like she didn't ever want to do anything with that. She did, she did it because she had to. She had to deal with Homelander's bullshit. She had to keep going on with it. And it broke my heart because... And then you see her having to, like, make these difficult decisions, like, lying to, like, the Stormfront, lying to A-Train, lying to everybody else, lying to, like, the one dude who could, like, chop off his limbs and shit. Oh, oh that, the that, prostitute that, gecko. Yeah, that, that dude was fucking weird. Yeah. Like, that was uncomfortable. Believe it, not, believe it or not, all the bullshit she goes through in the TV show, she actually has far less agency in the comics. And I think that's one of the biggest step ups of the adaptation is the fact that Starlight is given much more agency because it's much less of a damsel. And, and because in the comics, Huey knows, like if she doesn't find out that Huey is essentially using her until towards the end, if I remember correctly. And he he feels bad for half a second, but he's like, mm, no, fuck it, you know, I get to keep screwing her. So what's the point? I mean, I am you know dramatically bastardizing the issue, but you know what I mean is that their relationship is much more palatable because in the comics, it actually feels kind of gross at points that she has no agency. They, they don't, they don't, you know, nobody really likes her that she is just a tool to be used. So actually, you know, yeah, we still have to homage that with the fact that admittedly in Huey does treat her like shit at certain points, and especially in season one, it's so you, you, that's something that you have to bring over. But we have a much more self-aware Huey than the weird, self-deprecating man thing Garth Ennis likes to do in his books. Yeah. So we get to see them be a pair as opposed to her strictly being a tool. And I appreciate that she has more agency, and that agency grows in this season. That, yeah, she still has to do all the bullshit because she has to do all the heavy lifting in the comic book. 
but you know in like the undercover heavy lift you know what i'm trying to say but it's nice to see her being given more to do as a person yeah something that really surprised me about this season to begin with uh was like where they started off in this season like the first episode opens up we see both of them getting ready and we think it's just both of them getting ready to just do separate things and then it's just they're meeting on the train so they're they've still kept in contact since we last saw them and also i just something i like is that huey didn't expect anything from her like he didn't expect if this makes any sense like he didn't expect that like because they were working together that everything was peachy keen between them yep. and that they go back to the sack but i uh, like like that line like when she was just like huey you gotta get some sleep and he's like i will sleep when i know you're safe when you're not gonna get your head caved in by homelander um so and and like I think just the development of their relationship in this season was very good, especially like something I loved that I really wanted to see after the end of season one was her and like her being a part of the boys essentially. Yes. And like when I was seeing bits of that in the trailers, I was like, please, I, I want that. And then we just got the episode with her, Huey and MM going on the road trip. Uh her in like episode six. Uh, with Butcher trying to take care of Huey when he got impaled. Um, and then just like the the last episode, just all that. I, uh, I just, I think, I don't know. I'm trying to, I'm trying to formulate what I'm trying, what I need to say, but I, I just like their relationship is very strong. And I like that at the end when Huey's like, I need to stand on my own two feet and stop clinging to people. And she's like, oh, well, we can still be friends. She's like, no, oh, no, I'm not fucking crazy. I'm still yeah. going to you. I was right. like, are you I really like doing this they... whole giant, like, cheesy-ass drama moment where he throws her to the back to the side? And they're like, like no, no, I'm not sp- crazy. Like some Spider-Man 1 bullshit. Yeah, <laughs> like, like that dumb like, shit. He's like, no, I'm, like, I got my name cleared. There's no reason why, like, I... One theory I had before this last episode, which is half true, which half came true, is that Starlight would get her name cleared, but at the same time, Huey would be Huey would also get his name cleared on the condition that he had to live with her in Vought. So all of season three would be him in the lion's den with Homelander like threatening him every single day. And I see- I think you're right, but with the wrong character. I think we're going to see Elena slotted into that role. Yeah, 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 definitely. Ooh. 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 Uh-oh. Is it time? Is it time for is it time for Mary to uh So, well, no, like now we are going to enter the sh- the, the, the part of the show where I like to call Mary's Hot Takes. Brought to you by Maeve Pride the- Bars. Um <laughs> So, I want one. <laughs> So, you know that it's going to be like the grossest vegan shit. Like. Yes. So, Mary, you want to speak on the gloriousness and the struggle that is Queen Maeve. You have the floor. Oh, Lord have mercy. <laughs> <laughs> I should have gotten something to drink for this, but I didn't, so we're going to go through this sober. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, it just... In the comic books, Maeve is not bi. This is this is an inclusion. And honestly, I spent the whole season going, okay, Maeve's gonna die. Maeve's gonna die. Maeve has not died yet. Okay. So I'm fully expecting Maeve to die at some point because she does die in the comic books. It's um, ironically kind of a twisted, you know, girls get it done thing because she actually st- she steps in to defend Starlight from Homelander and Homelander just fucking mows her down. Mm-hmm. So, but Victoria even made a bury your gaze joke, so we'll have to see where it goes from there. But, um, her whole thing in season one with Elena, I, I was pleasantly surprised because I'm like, oh, they're going to stick in here somewhere. And it's definitely a poke at Wonder Woman being bisexual. But, um, the fact that I appreciate that we got to a point where that Maeve could be essentially forced herself to be honest with Elena and then that became public because 
let me tell you, as somebody, I mean, I was significantly younger, but as someone who has been publicly outed, it is not fun. And to have to have that kind of a thing happen is terrifying enough as it is. But is everything okay over there? Alec, are you yeah. being arrested? <laughs> uh, yeah, a uh, lot found me. Um, no, uh, I, I live right by I live right by a hospital, so there's always okay, ambulances just, coming. And it going. sounds like you live in Hell's Kitchen, dog. Yeah. Uh, yeah ironically to- enough, yes. I just didn't. I just didn't want to be going off about you know Maeve's gay bars and Alec is being wheeled out of his apartment on his stretcher. <laughs> like, <laughs> everything is okay. It, it will happen someday, but today is not that day. So go <laughs> ahead. But um, you know, I'll mute my mic. Out, it is really, uh, being publicly outed is pretty much any gay person's or any queer person's nightmare. It's not just gay people, but it, it is everybody's nightmare of being outed before you are ready. And to not only have to deal with that fear, but you have a superhero, you know, this, this, you know, Superman-esque evil guy breathing down the back of your neck that, you know, he murdered some Hollywood executive. What would he do to someone that Maeve actually loves? Mm. Like, anything he did to the Hollywood executive would pale in comparison to what Homelander would do to Elena. And that's clearly fucked with me because they're clearly very deeply in love with each other. Yeah. And I can't blame Elena for not being down for it because first of all, you go from, you know, your girlfriend just completely ignoring, like ignoring you that you can't go out to dinner. You can't go dancing. You can't go to a bar. You have to stay in because Maeve needs to be straight kind of a thing. And so then Maeve tries to let her guard down and she lets Elena in and, you know, they kind of get back together a little bit and then boom, her worst nightmare, Vought immediately finds out about it. Her Homelander and getting outed on public TV like that, like that fucking hurts. And then you get to corporatize it. Mm -hmm. And a long, like, standing criticism of pride, you know, as, as society has advanced and as excuse me, LGBTQ representation becoming gradually more accepted, I think specifically gay representation has become more accepted in the mainstream that we see a lot of corporate pandering during Pride Month. Unfortunately, I do fall victim to a lot of it because I like, I think Rainbow Mouthwash would be like the little Rainbow Mouthwash is fun. I I do fall victim to it sometimes because, because rainbows, um, But that shows you just how easy that is to get sucked in with that. And I think it's Ashley that points it out that America loves a good coming out story because it's a very feel good story. So crafting this ridiculous narrative with Maeve and Elena, I'm really disappointed we didn't actually get to see it play out a little bit. And even Elena's kind of curling her lip at the fact that, you know, she has to wear like the lesbian pantsuit, as it were. Uh. That that whole thing, it is both viscerally painful and like absolutely hysterical at the same goddamn time. There's gotta be a masculine one. Exactly. And you know, even the comment that she makes that, you know, lesbian relationships play better if one of them is slotted into the mask role. Or masculine. Mask is lesbian shorthand, I guess. Um but if one of them is the mask. So it, it's just, it's very funny. And the way that they're kind of poking at the corporatization of pride with, because we have the uh, the Brave Mave bar, we have the Brave Mave vegan burger or something like that. And then, I don't know if you guys caught it, but um, the when lasagna. Becca's, the lasagna, when Becca's making dinner, it's mm-hmm. like Brave Mave lasagna and it's got all rainbows all over it. I want that lasagna, by the way. <laughs> and, and you know it's like the most stereotypical vegan crap. Like, yep. no, no disrespect to anyone who is vegan, but that is the stereotype that gets lumped in with a lot of gay people. Agreed. So I love that they're poking fun at it, but they're not playing it as a joke. Well, at the same time, not downplaying the, the stressfulness of this narrative. Because I don't think Maeve necessarily cares about being outed. And Elena appears to be completely out herself. So it's not necessarily that. I think it's just the irritation that comes with it. That 
Maeve is more concerned with Elena's safety, and Elena just wants to be with her goddamn girlfriend. And, and like, like, um, there was the moment when they were doing the whole, like, the fake outing in the movie thing, where there was the other, like, lesbian character in the movie, and that girl just wanted just to talk to Maeve for, like, two seconds, because she did inspire her. But because of what Maeve's going through, it was like, damn, that really sucks. Like, Maeve wanted nothing to do with it. Those new Joss rewrites really huh? God damn it, I loved that. I loved that that little jab. Because not only that, it's also kind of poking fun at Willow and Tara with Buffy. Yeah. Because that that was a whole, it was a very inspiring situation, you know, was, and I watched Buffy as a younger person, like most people did. And naturally, you really gravitated to Willow and Tara, and then it ends fucking stupidly. Mm-hmm. But So it's just kind of, it's a multifaceted poke that the writers have a really fun time doing. And so we get the horror of Maeve having to deal with fact that elena is now in serious danger elena is in more danger than she realizes <laughs> and then we have the whole her finding the footage oh my heart that, when that happened that, that goes even a, a very interesting direction because elena is very shaken up about this like she now realizes that this is what Maeve was trying to keep her from and i think part of her because the whole scene where Maeve flips the table I think she's starting to kind of realize that, okay, this is what she didn't want me to see. She's like, because Maeve does the whole, you wanted me to show you the real me. And she's like, I do. And now I'm kind of regretting it. But the fact that she goes out of her way that to very specifically state that she's not blaming Maeve for this. And that's something we don't really see a lot. That this is, they've, they've clearly been together for years. This is a very comfortable relationship. And, you know, they've, they've spent a few years apart from each other, but they've been clearly been together for a long time. So, like, she understands, you know, th- there's that complexity that comes when you've been with someone for years at a time. And I think it, the, I don't know if it's a breakup or not, though. Elena basically just saying that she needs time to process this. Like, she's still, at least the way that season two ends, we don't really get a resolution with that. But it's her basically saying, I need to understand this. Like, I still want to be with you, but holy shit, maybe you were right about something. So there's that. And then it kind of, you know, leads to the even bigger problem slash narrative is the bi erasure. (sighs) It's very intentionally done. And Ashley even says as much that... They are essentially forcing a bisexual woman to be a lesbian because she is in a relationship with another woman. Uh, newsflash, a bi person, you know, like a bi man can be with another man and still be bi, and a bi woman can be with another woman and still be a woman, like, and still, you know, be bisexual. But that's something that they have to put up with a lot, is that, oh, you're gay now, or oh, you're straight now. It's, no, you're bi either way. And I like that we see Elena actually kind of bitch slap them and go, you realize Maeve is bi, right? And, like, Maeve just sat there and, was, and just took it. Like, she took what, what Ashley said and was just like, just deal with it. I don't want to be here. Like, the fact that she took it showed that she was just trying to keep everybody calm and safe and not have to deal with Homelander. But it's just, like, and, and you know, you really feel, because bi erasure is a huge problem that I think a lot of people don't realize it, and it, it also kind of pokes at the fact that if you have bi representation in media or like in comics or in tv in a sense it has to be performative it's something i've noticed a lot because if you have bi male character or bi men by by guys they're typically in relationships with men and same with bi women like, in a sense, you feel like there's this unwritten rule that in order to quote-unquote count, again, air quotes, it has to be performed in some way. Mm-hmm. And so I think the show's kind of taking a shot at that, that we see um, Maeve with men. Because after Elena leaves, she brings home a couple of guys, and that was, I, <laughs> I didn't notice the other one at first, and then when I did, all I saw was just ass, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> 
but even the, like even Ashley's reaction of this is not le- like this is not lesbian. You're supposed to be lesbian, and Maeve is just kind of like fuck you. And so I like that we get we kind of get to see her stand her ground a little bit, and I'm hoping that maybe we'll get to see a narrative shift of that Maeve will get to be publicly bi at some point. That would be dope. But we've got to get through whatever's going on with Homelander, Maeve, and Elena before I think we can before I think the show will even address the public identity thing. Mary, but I, I have a question like, for you. What's that? Do girls do it better? I'm gonna slap you. <laughs> well, no, I'm, I was trying to like, 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 like lead that segue. Like, I know you're trying to, you're trying to get me off of this. Well, no, because Maeve is great, but like, I, I want to like transition Maeve into the Maeve Starlight in in um Stormfront conversation that we need to have because I want to keep you on your okay. pedestal, but like, I wanted to use that as a clean ass segue into that. <laughs> I know, but I still want to slap you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I have to give Victoria credit for this because she's the one who made the initial connection to me and she said if I didn't give her credit, she'd be very angry with me. There is a scene in episode five where it's, you know, Dawn of the Seven and there is a scene where we're trying to, you know, Vaude is trying to push the whole girls get it done uh, gimmick that, they, that we've seen through the most of the season because, you know, almost half of the seven is women and that's never happened before. So they need to corporately capitalize on that. So there is a scene in Dawn of the Seven that we see them shooting, which is very, very similar to the, uh, it is not the A-Force people, but the quote-unquote A-Force scene in Endgame. I am very uppity. I am very uppity. Hold on, hold on. I gotta gotta crack my knuckles here because I'm ready for war. All right. I'm ready for the MCU shills. Let's go. Alec, you want to go? You want to go? That's the problem. Like, <laughs> side I got nothing. <laughs> he got side nothing. Note. Here's the thing, though, is that we have to discuss the differences in topics, but it is not a franchise thing. And I hate that all of these arguments get boiled down to a franchise argument Agreed. when it's legitimate critique. And this scene, because episode five was written by a woman, and, and it's very important that episode five and episode eight were written by women for these specific points. Episode five was written by Ellie Monahan, and episode eight was written by Rebecca Sonnenschein. And those are the two sides of this narrative that we see. Because in episode five, they're filming the girl power scene, and I'm, you know, do the whole peace, Spice Girls peace sign, girl power, that's what I'm talking about when I say girl power, pop, pop girl power. And, you know, Victoria kind of pointed out, she's like, hey, this reminds me of that scene in Endgame. And I'm like, yeah, me too. And she's like, no, this seems really, really similar. So, you know, we watched it and we pulled it up and they are exactly the same. Literally almost word for word. Because we have the MacGuffin. We have the Infinity Gauntlet and the USB drive. And Ruby actually, and Ruby says, um, but how are you going to get through all of them? Because we have the CG mutants coming through. Yeah. And Starlight says, don't worry. And Stormfront says, girls, get it done. So I pulled up the end game scene. And Peter has the MacGuffin. And he says, I don't know how you're going to get it through all of that. And then Scarlet Witch says, don't worry. And Okoye says, she's got help. And in both scenes, they take a girl power stance that we have this unnecessary scene of seeing them get together and, you know. So it, it is a direct shot at that scene. And first of all, I felt seen because I am, I'm not critical of it. Fuck it, I am critical of it. Like, it's visually a fun scene, but I am very critical of it because narratively it doesn't make any goddamn sense. No, it does not. <laughs> it really doesn't. It, it doesn't. It's like Gamora <laughs> ha- ha- like, doesn't know any of these bitches, but she's ready for a throwdown. Sure, let's go. That whole but scene I mean, was just like, you know who's the future of the MCU? Black people and women. Here you go. Why weren't they there yes. before? We don't want to answer that. Because <laughs> I actually, it's really funny because the Twitter thread actually came up in our Discord server uh, either today or yesterday. But I did this whole big deconstruction Twitter thread. And I point out that it, it, it's clear pandering. And visually, the scene is fun. The scene is fun. I think the scene is very fun. But you kind of have to sit back and realize to a point that this is just corporate shilling. Hmm. Girls get done and she's got help are slogans that you would see on a t-shirt. That, you know, 
th those are very marketable phrases. And that's, I mean, these, the lines are literally word for word. Because I went back, we watched w both scenes repeatedly. And, you know, Victoria and I are pointing out the similarities between the two. And Victoria made the point to say that, you know, first of all, Captain Marvel doesn't need the help. Nope. And, no, she does not know. <laughs> and sh she immediately points out that there is only one instance in the scene, in the endgame scene, where we see the women actually working together. They all kind of tank off and do their own things. So we've got Okoye stabbing people with the spear. There's a lot of stabbing. Like, Stab. But... Valkyrie and Scarlet Witch are the only time we actually see any of them work together because Scarlet Witch holds the little serpent thingies and Valkyrie takes her sword down the side of one of them. And that is very important. So, I mean, we have these corporate scenes and I think it's really interesting that a woman kind of critiqued the scene a little bit because, if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Russos wrote Endgame, didn't they? Yes. So, yeah, I think there are there are men who write female who write lady characters very well. I'm just gonna put that out there. Greg Rocca is one of my favorite writers, and I think he writes women pretty much better than most other writers that I like. However, Marvel, the MCU, does not have a great track record with women, and I'm not gonna give him a pass for it. Because the scene is cool, and like Travis said, the future is black people and women. Where were they before? We don't want to talk about that. They don't get to get a pass from it just because Captain Marvel made a billion dollars. It's not how critique works. Yeah. Yeah. And then we transition to episode eight, where <laughs> we have the, I like to call the bitches get shit done scene. Because if you, if you think about it, bitches get shit done, and girls get it done. It's just, it's a sanitized phrase of that. I I I want I want to call it the, the 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 girls get the curb stomp because that's what that felt like that that mm -hmm. was literally the, them just smashing her fucking face. In. It was taken Fuck from the Nazis. comics, right? It was taken from the comics, right? But like in in the comics, it was the boys kicking the shit out of Stormfront and not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so episode, like I said, episode eight is written by Rebecca Sonnenshine. At least I'm, I'm assuming that's how her name is pronounced. Uh, apologies if it's not. But um, they immediately, because it's when Maeve interrupts the fight. Uh, ironically, a very Wonder Woman-like introduction. Um, yes. Yes. You're right. Holy shit. It's, it's the BBS dropping down thing. Uh huh. It's a very Wonder Woman also, entrance. Also, for the record, um, the Endgame script apparently was written by Christopher Marcus and Stephen McFeely. Yeah, my point still stands. Yeah, but it was bugging me. I didn't know if the room wrote it. There's no girl power stance, and they immediately start working together because even before Maeve gets there, um, uh, oh my God, uh, Annie and Kimiko, they immediately go in together. Yeah. And we actually see it be effective. And it kind of, for my, for the whole point that I'm trying to make, it kind of bugs me that we didn't get to see them charge into battle in the girls get it done scene. Because, but I have a feeling with the way that they were poking at just the corporate pandering that is the quote unquote A4 scene, I imagine it would have played out very similar is that they all would have charged off because we have to see them be badass individually because we just spent the last 10 years with all of these glorified sidekicks who do nothing. Sorry. I am very critical. <laughs> but in the bitches get shit done scene, in the scene in, in uh, episode eight, they immediately start working together. And we have, you know, the, the Maeve Wonder Woman entrance. And it's just, it's an immediate stomping. Like they whoop her ass. And then Peaches plays in the background. Yes. It, it's even more hilarious when that song is actually the theme to, to Sam B's, um, late night show on tbs so like that's <laughs> that's even funnier on like a more meta level but it's also kind of I like i listen to that shit unironically <laughs> oh god no I, I fucking love peaches i love her so much and it, she's kind of like that that grungy girl punk rocker kind of thing because it's just and it's it's kind it, it's unpolished and it, it's 
like the choreography is really gross and it's what an actual fight would look like so we don't need the theatrics of you know girls get it done strike a pose then charge off together it's no we're gonna stomp this not nazi bitch's ass it's eat my shit you nazi bitch oh the curb stop was so glorious and here's the thing the booby trap fight from birds of prey Ooh, yeah it's the same, same it's the same thing because in the booby trap fight in the booby trap fight, um, it's the one where they're all with all the guys, and they have you know the the prop. You guys have seen the movie, yeah. So you know what you, you know. I have not seen. I have not seen it yet. You've never seen Birds of Prey. I'm I'm waiting to do a commentary track okay. someday, but yeah, I okay. have not seen it yet. Fair enough. Okay, well, there's a big fight scene. <laughs> Spoiler alert: there's a fight scene in a superhero movie. <laughs> um, but. And I think this is just kind of a happy accident because they probably would have been season two of the boys in Bird's Brain may have been filming around the same time. Because I can't imagine that Birds of Prey would have released before the voice was done being scripted kind of a thing, you know, mm. because Birds of Prey, dear God, came out at the beginning of this year. <sighs> this year, this this year has been a long week. Um, but, yeah, no, this year has been a long week, um, but, um, but in the booby trap fight, they immediately start working together because they have to, because in, in the booby trap fight, there is a MacGuffin because Cass Kane is the MacGuffin. There is no MacGuffin in the scene that forces them. They work together out of necessity, but mm -hmm. in the booby trap fight, they have to work together to protect Cass. And so we see Harley Quinn and Canary pairing off and we see Renee and Huntress pairing off a lot. And the action is constantly moving. There's no, you know, one bad guy taking you know, one bad guy at a time thing that we see in a lot of movies from action to super, you know, from action to horror or whatever. It's just, it's a constant barrage of action and nobody ever stops moving. And even in the curb stop, nobody ever stops. There's nothing cinematic about it. This is a bare knuckle brawl. Yeah. And it's very much the same thing in the booby trap fight. And Birds of Prey was written by Christina Hodson. I think that this whole thing is a critique of what happens when Joss Whedon eh, writes a girl power scene, when men write girl power scenes and how a woman would write the scene. And I know somebody is shrieking in the distance, SJWs, I hate men, whatever. That's not that's not my point. They can eat shit. I named my child after fucking Joss Whedon's only good thing, which was fucking Serenity. So they can all eat shit because it turned out Joss Whedon was a piece of shit later. And like, let's be real here. If you haven't figured, like, the, the Birds of Prey episode is our most watched episode. If you haven't figured out that we're what you think SJWs are by now, that we just don't give a fuck. <laughs> Like, literally, people have, like, oh, freaking Mary's wife has called us the drunk sorority girl of comic podcasts. We don't give a fuck. Like, we, oh, no, we, we want people to be treated fairly and respected. Uh, like, uh, like uh, this, 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 is a this is a podcast with a gay man who knows a ton about comics. I, I should know, let me correct that. A black gay man who knows a, lot of, a ton about comics. A lesbian woman that knows more than the, 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 than the guy about comics, and she can run me around circles. And a, another black guy who's, who loves Batman. Like, we, we don't give a fuck. Like... Actually, and, and then we have the bisexual that's Alec just stapled to the whole package right now. Like, we don't care, bro. Like, come on now. I forget who said it to me once, but I have the comic book, like, the comic book knowledge of, like, a 50-year-old white man, and I hate how much sense that makes. <laughs> it's true! <laughs> like, 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 why do you, like, we did a freaking, like, also, like, 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 we did a whole episode about All New Wolverine. We, we're, we're covering Ultimates next week. Like, we're literally covering a book about... Blue Marvel, Black Panther, Captain Marvel, America Chavez, and, and uh, freaking Monica Rambeau next week. Like, have you not got what show this is by now? But that, like, like, like come on now. Like, let's be real here. But so, but, yeah. But, but going back to all of that, I, I know this has been kind of a rambly point, but this is something I'm really excited to talk about because it's something that's so easily missed. Mm -hmm. Because that's kind of a wink and a nod to. I mean, most people on you know the industrialized world, if you will, have seen Endgame. Yeah. But it's just it's such a it's such a precise poking 
of here is the pop girl power feminism. And a lot of people bought into the scene. And I'm not, I am not saying the scene is cool. And I'm not trying to say you can't like things. You know, you, you're not allowed to like things. But I'm saying that just because something looks cool and is liked doesn't mean it can't be critiqued. And I think that there is a difference between actual critique and shit posting. And this is not shit posting. This is me kind of, and in a sense, these two, uh, Rebecca and Ellie, kind of poking fun at the fact of this is, you know, girls get it done t shirt, you know, pop girl power versus a bitch will fucking stomp you. Yep. And again, you see where I realize that this could d- devolve into a franchise thing of Marvel versus DC, of Endgame versus Birds of Prey. I, that's not the case. I think it is how, m- like, men can write and and i'm not trying to use men as a scapegoat here because like i said greg rucka greg rucka would never write a scene like that (laughs) but i i think it's more of the critique of pop feminism versus actual like empowerment because once peaches starts playing and you're just you're stomping a nazi bitch and who doesn't want to take their girl game to go stomp a nazi in the face like that sounds fun or, you know, if you have to protect, you know, a preteen girl from getting cut open by Black Mask or whatever, yeah, you're gonna, like, fucking stomp the shit out of some people with, like, hammers and canary screeches and shit. Right. But I, I think it's just a difference between, air quote, how men write po- how men write women and how women write women. Because there's that whole subreddit that I fucking love. It's called r slash men writing women and it's hysterical. (laughs) She walks boobily into the room kind of shit. And so that's the kind of writing that they're ripping on. It's not men can't write women ever. It's, you know, she bounced boobily (laughs) down the stairs. Love chunks. Love chunks. Love chunks. This is ripping. Oh, this is ripping on the Frank Millers that write love chunks. So, but so yes, um, that. But, like, yeah, uh, I just I loved it. So yeah, no, that was glorious. And so so and then to to, to echo, I, I think Frenchie was literally me and Travis on a daily listening to Mary, where it's like, damn, girls do do it better. And I think that straight is, up <laughs> in the coffin that. You're, you're fed the pop feminism and you don't, the, the pop empowerment and it's like, this is cool, it's nice but whatever, nah these supers are gonna stomp this Nazi bitch and you're like, oh shit okay, maybe you know, girls yeah. do get it done yeah. like, it, bitches get shit done so from there, we need to talk about the bi- the biggest like overarching thing of this season, and that is the spawn of, of Homelander the, the Nazism and the weird sexualization of the two together. So, I woke up last week not expecting to to see um, Travis and Mary in my, in my mentions going, James, you need to watch this episode. I'm like, why, guys? What happened? And then go, so, um, Homelander and, and Stormfront fuck very violent, violently after murdering a man. And I'm like, what? And they're and like, they rub blood in each other's mouths and, and shit. And, and, yeah. I, and I just, I couldn't cope with that. And I was trying to understand why this was happening. And then I watched the preceding episode before that, where like, like they have the really awkward dream on fuck. And I was just like, this is not okay. I'm not okay with this. <laughs> Like this is like this is like he- like a he- heterosexuality cranked up to fifty thousand, and I don't like it. So, but that, that, there's the joke to end to enter this topic. But <laughs> I honestly felt the same, right? Like like the violent throwing them across the room and the burning of the tits with the laser vision. You're just like this is so painfully like this is what neckbeards want Superman and Wonder Woman to fuck like, and it's not okay. Honestly. <laughs> like honestly, like this just laser vision my tits. No, no, don't do that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, like that. that, that it, it felt like a new Fifty Two, lo- like, like, like Diana and Clark wet dream, and it made me uncomfortable. And Mary, I hope you appreciated that reference. But like, <laughs> because that that book gives me a headache. Yeah. So it's just like 
this entire, I, I, I think, I, I love that I, that I was, I hit the nail on the head when it came to Homelander, that I was right, that them making um, Stormfront a woman compared to the comics was going to be an evolution of the mommy issues. I, I called it from jump, and it was, it was going to be right, the nail on the head, because at first it was like, maybe they're just going to beef, maybe they're just going to beef, and it's going to be funny, no big deal, and then the dream on starts playing, and you're just like, and like, like she looks in d- deep into his eyes, and there's that "I'm your mommy now" look, and you're just like, "Oh God, here we go." And then he finds out that she is actually for real a mother, and he's like, "Yes." Like, like that made it even worse. And then, like during that whole whole sequence, you hear her like her German accent start to slip into her voice, and I was like, "That's powerful acting on Aya Cash's part." That was like, oh yeah, bold that she was starting to like be convicted in the Nazism. Like that was mwah, beautiful, Chef's kiss. Like that, like con- like conviction, just yeah. But no, Homelander as a character this season. I actually wanted to see Homelander, like, be less dark this season. I wanted to see him maybe try to reform Vought's image. And then they're like, no, you literally don't have the the power to fix Vought's image. Because someone is ruining that for you. The new girl is ruining that for you. And I was like, okay, this is an interesting take. And then it became, oh no, now... He's just going to start, like, enforcing everything, and Ashley has no power. And that was an interesting dynamic. Because, now, like, like that whole scene with the knockoff Asian daredevil dude, I was like, oh, this is going to go bad. This is going to go bad really fast. And he just goes, slap! And I'm like, oh! He reminded me of Daredevil's sidekick that they blind did spot in all, yes. all different Bl- blind spot yeah like 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 it's like they combined the two together and I was like because the cause Charles Soule's Daredevil is fucking amazing you should go read it everybody but like that whole moment I, I I was just like why y'all really just like took a shot at Daredevil and said why do you exist and it hurt my spirit like why do you do this to me but like Homelander is a character and then him since he didn't have his mom his mom figure anymore to the point that he was making the knockoff male mystique dude like be a uh, 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 oh doppelganger yeah have oh, doppelganger no. be still when, well when when he turned into homelander that I whole moment that. that whole moment was just gold well at first and i was like his first year that one moment where like homelander disgustingly drinks like like licks the breast milk that was uh, but like uh, that was just wrong i appreciate there was hey. significantly less sexual fetishization of uh, this season. Yes. You should definitely not leave out the fact that he fucking warmed it up with his heat vision. He did! I he warmed, warmed up the that. breast milk with his heat vision. And then there's the moment with Doppelganger where Stillwell's like like, like Stillwell's holding the um the, like, the, the glass of milk. And I was like, please don't let there be more breast milk. Please. That's just so right. wrong. And then I... she like dips her fingers in it and like shoves it in his mouth. And I'm like, why? Why is this happening? And then they're the, the, the doing more weird shit. But then the moment he comes back later, and like, like or the, 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 the scene progresses, and Doppelganger changes back because being the way he is hurts him. He can't hold that shit for long. So he changes back, and the, like the, you see Homelander break psych, like 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 like, like, like psycho mentally. He breaks because he wasn't prepared for that. He was in a good headspace mentally and was happy that his mommy had him and it was really interesting to to see him just go anger levels like change back or i'm literally gonna kill you like that had to be so anxiety inducing for doppelganger and then there's that really awkward moment later where he turns into homelander and i was like this can really be funny if homelander embraces this and that's where we don't have the mommy issues anymore and like like if it, the the break could have been there where Doppelganger becomes like the antithesis of the I can do whatever I want on 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 the skyscraper. That would have been funny. That would have been gold. But it didn't, and I was kind of like whatever. But the fact that he just kind of snaps Doppelganger's neck and leaves them there to die, I'm like, damn, you really want a mommy, dude? Like Jesus Christ. Um. It- Elizabeth Shue got another paycheck out of it. Right? Like, I thought they just yeah. fried her ass and said no. Positive of the scene. That, that was the one, one positive. One moment Something I keep... I... Oh, go ahead. 
one moment I keep thinking about is the breakfast scene in episode three where he's sitting and has the pancakes and he just sips the glass of milk and then just lets it simmer for a while. Yeah. And I'm just like, no, please don't. It, just, it, it was... It was uh, some, go ahead, Mary. I was going to say something thematically that I thought was very interesting with the notion of motherhood is because motherhood is a very big theme in the show. And it, I think a lot of it, because we talked about this earlier in the show, it's the nature versus nurture thing. But at the same time, I think it ties in most interestingly with Stormfront. Because Stormfront has a lot of emotional baggage about losing her daughter. That, you know, this is superpowers aside, she is very much a trad wife. Or a traditional wife. But I think that is an interesting subversion of the motherhood narrative. Because if you look at media as a whole, we are kind of conditioned to sympathize with mothers that Becca's emotional story arc is that she is a mother and we are drawn to that. That, you know, we are supposed to sympathize with her as a mother wanting to do what's right by her child. But what happens when that narrative is in the hands of a Nazi? Yeah. Because so the, the thing about Stormfront is that if you look at the character that is presented to the public, she is very endearing. That, you know, even people who are unfamiliar with the books in the first two episodes were simping for Stormfront real hard on social media. And I'm just kind of sitting here going, oh my god, oh my god. Because she uses the very subtle dog whistles throughout. And there there was always, you know, something else little that, that they would poke at even after the reveal that she was, you know, the white, the Nazi bitch. There was always be a little something that kind of challenged your perspective. Because that, you know, you have her and Becca kind of simultaneously. So you have to feel for Becca as a mother, which is something that we're conditioned to do just through all of media. Just take a second and think about every book, movie, or TV show that you've seen with a mother. Mothers are upstanding and they're righteous and they're going to protect you kind of a thing. Because yeah. even with Annie, even with Annie's mother, you, you are kind of thought... You, you're essentially told to believe she her heart was in the right place and that she wants to make it right what happens when that narrative is in the hands of a nazi it, it pulls at those same heartstrings and it makes you step back and recontextualize everything and so i love that we're not just getting a superhero deconstruction we're getting just a media deconstruction that nothing is ever as easy as it seems because then you're like it's fuck she's a nazi have no sympathy for the nazis like and what's even crazy is, like, the whole mother ar- overarching thing even takes a turn when the crazy Stormfront speech happens with Homelander, where, like, she's confessing her entire life to him, and she goes, yo, who do you think that is? Your grandmother? That's my daughter. And the whole thing takes a drastic turn, and you see him even more, like, emphasize the idea of, you're my mommy, and then there's the whole thing with Huey and Annie of the like the the lack of mother versus like I have this, but I don't want it in my life anymore, and that was interesting. Then Butcher Butcher had an interesting moment twice where you have him battling with his aunt and him battling with his own mother over his father, and that spoke to me as well, mm-hmm. where it's like. Butcher really doesn't want uh, like any female to tell him what to do besides Becca. Like that, the, the, he he has no need for a mother. He just wants to create a, a family with his like like with Becca. That spoke to me in, in a in a big way. Um. So yeah, no. Like the, the the whole theme of that entire arc is just phenomenal. Um, Mary, did I cut you off? I'm sorry. Fine. Okay. I, yeah. I'm, I'm good. Okay. Um, I think we've covered a lot of the major stuff. Um, I think I, I, I think the one thing that me and Travis need to speak on um, is the goat that is um, uh, Mr. Edgar. Uh, like, like that, that is just who that like I I was very concerned about the character of Edgar in season one because I thought that um, he was just going to be, like, in the background and Stillwell was still going to be a thing and whatever else. Like, 
it was going to be fine. Like, he was just going to be this background character that didn't bother nobody. But then, they started off real different with him in Season 2 by having, like, the big board meeting and everything. And Giancarlo Esposito seems to have more time in his schedule because now that he's not doing Mandalorian right now, he stepped more into prominence this season. And with that, you saw him taking more control he stood up to homelander like he slapped his dick on the table and, and said my dick is bigger than yours shut the fuck up and D homelander backed off and when homelander tries to rally the seven against edgar edgar's like whatever i can make more of you bitches and that spoke volumes to me but the end of the finale of the whole show there's that golden moment where Butcher. And, well, first of all, there's the first uh, thing with, with Butcher where um, he like, he calls Butcher through Black Noir. That was a golden scene. But then this happens in the final episode with Butcher, where uh, like Butcher's like, "Yo, dude, why would you really t like like want to keep tolerating this Nazi racist shit?" And he's like, "Of course not. Like, but I can't just lash out." I, that's a white man's job. I don't have time for that nonsense. I don't have luxuries for that kind of bullshit. And that right there was so powerful that that Stan Edgar as a character has to literally mind his P's. He's one, he's one of the richest men in the whole world. He has to mind his P's and Q's because the the, le the least little slip, slip up could cost him everything. That spoke volume that they cared enough between the stuff that happened with A-Train and that. Like, I was just blown the fuck away by that. Travis, holla at me here. Because you, po like, you posted it in the meme after I was, like, dumbfounded with the whole damn episode. I need you to speak on this. <laughs> Um, I I have a, a secret, like, woke crush on fucking Giancarlo Esposito ever since seeing School Days for the first time. I don't know if, if anyone hasn't seen School Days. He is the antagonist. Mm -hmm. Um, He's Dean Almighty. So seeing him as the CEO of Vought saying that shit, I was like, oh my fucking God. It feels like, it to me, it feels feels like Giancarlo Esposito kind of embodies everything that there is about righteous black anger, but from a upper echelon hoity-toity place, if that makes sense. Like, he's he's super fucking calculated. Yep. He's a high-functioning sociopath, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. And in any time he's in a role like this, whether it be Gus Frayn from Breaking Bad... Uh, Dean Almighty from School Days, or this, this one in The Boys, he embodies this this cool, calm collectiveness that I don't know. Black representation doesn't really get. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And and not just black representation, but also Latinx representation because he is Afro Latino. There is no doubt about that. So I don't know the way he. It's hard to describe, like. The way he is on screen is almost like like butter perfectly melting on a stack of flapjacks. Like mm. I always love him on screen. I it, can never get over how wonderful he is. And they could have easily just cheapened him as a character and just made him that ultimate Uncle Tom, that dude, that black dude who is like drank the Kool Aid and only cares about the money. But not only is he sociopathic, he took it to the next level by saying, "Nah." Fuck that white bitch. Like, I don't care. <laughs> Nothing is going to stop me from coming between me and my money. I was like, damn, that's fucking right. goat shit right there. Like, that man literally said, nothing is going to become between me and my money. I was like, damn. So, Not to mention, when, when he said that, like, I can't lash out like that, that's a white man's privilege. It really brought me back to when he was talking about Homelander and straight up told him, we're not a superhero company. We're a pharmaceutical company. Yep. Because could you imagine the shit he went through to run Vought? Un Especially when it was created by like a Nazi. It, right. It was created by Nazis. So there, fuck Homelander. Everything that he had, that John Carlo had gone through was far lesser than anything Homelander could do, and that was the vibe I got from him the whole show. Yeah. And like there was that, but like, I still just love that moment where Homelander thought that like he had taken his Viagra pill and rose up with the seven around Giancarlo Esposito. And 
I just was like, it's like, like Edgar just turns around and walks out because he's like, all right, whatever. Like, I don't care. Y'all got time for y'all. Like, I'm gonna keep moving. And he was that. It was it was very clean too because at the end of that episode, after Stormfront goes through the whole joint and causes all the havoc that she did, he was ready. Mm-hmm. He had the alibis. He had the statements prepared, and he was like, "Yeah, bitch, you need me. So shut the fuck up." Like, like, like that, that, that clout, that, like, that readiness to with the plan at every step of the way, ready to to deal with it. Like that moment where where Black Noir is ready to choke Butcher the hell out and kill everybody in the room, and he immediately yep. picks up the phone and says, "What you got?" Like he he he's the goat, and I love it to death. <laughs> See, and like I, I, I'm gonna put on my koofy here for one second, oh, God. but it was it was wonderful for once to see a, a black man in power use a white supremacist for gain and yes. then discard her when he was done using. Yes. Her. Because he was like, oh, no, she's Nazi. We didn't know. She's gone. I'm like, yep, that was beautiful. I feel like he knew the whole time because of the phone call with the Scientology guy at the end. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it was like he knew she was a Nazi, but she was profitable. And motherfuckers about his money. He was chasing a bag. Yeah, and of course he was there. And of course he had to put up with her because not only was she Vought's wife, it was you have to keep putting up with her, changing her identity and do whatever you need to do because she could literally bring the whole damn company down. She could ex- exercise her right as Mrs. Vaught to take everything from you and say that Vaught was a superhero company first. So the fact that he right. was able to just be the goat like that was just, oh my God. Um, yeah, he was, it was amazing. Um, Mary, uh, Alec, do you have any thoughts on this? I think we kind of went a little too, too black on you for a second. No, you're fine. Um, I think Giancarlo Esposito was born to play the villain. Yes. Yeah. Always, yes. I mean, nothing but respect for my Lex Luthor. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot he does play Lex I, Luthor I, and Harley I, Quinn. He's a, he's Lex Luthor and Harley Quinn, and I really hope he gets to come back for season three. Because it's just, uh, it's so perfect. Yes. But... I think he is an actor of a truly ungodly caliber. And I, I have a, a soft spot in my heart for just, like, true character actors like that. And, you know, they always say it takes the nicest people to play the biggest bad guys. And I've heard that he is nothing but just absolutely sweet and loving. Yes. So, but it, the, the fact that they were even able to inject that kind of duality, like I said, the writers are always pulling something out from underneath you, you know? Yeah. Um, Alec, do you, do you have any comments on this before we like talk about future of the show? Um, earlier this year, uh, for a class I took, I watched uh, for the first time. I watched "Do the Right Thing," and I oh, had no yes. clue he was in. Such it. a good movie! It is. Yes. It is. Like I rem- like I watched it, and then it's just like months later. I was just like, it is amazing how nothing has changed. Yep. Like, thank God for the lips. I mean, I know, like, I'm I am the last person to say this, but like, it, n- like, nothing has changed, and it just his role in that movie was just so. It's such a far cry from what he's known as now, but he is still like amazing, and like, I just he. He he is he reminds me in a way like he he's one of those actors who's just like a human chameleon mm-hmm. in a way. Absolutely, yeah. Like uh, a lot of people describe like Robert Pattinson as a human chameleon. Giancarlo Esposito is a human chameleon as yes. well. Um, oh my and- god! Giancarlo Esposito and Meryl Streep in a character drama together. Ooh, that would be oh, oh, make it happen! Make it happen! <laughs> okay. That, that is was... too much. I'm sorry. That is too... Sorry. You're I'm good. Sorry. Um, well, 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 <laughs> was... I'm gonna break. Can I... Oh god. <laughs> Can I make one joke about do the right thing? Sure. It... Rosie Perez is still hot as hell, though. I'm just gonna say that. <laughs> um. Man. Okay. So from there, we're gonna go ahead and like we we we, are, we have officially crossed the two hour mark. So. Um, like actually, they're, they're, actually, I think we're a little bit on, we're a little bit under still because like we, st- we, I, I like let us in like a, a little bit after the recording started. So I have a couple more minutes. So before we close, I want to get everybody's like thoughts on the future because we know for a fact that Jensen Ackles is going to be playing Soldier Boy, the original superhero, Ooh. in season two, <laughs> and season, in season three. 
So, now that we see th- what is coming, I think that with um the I can do whatever I want jerk off scene at the end, I think <laughs> Soldier Boy coming in is going to be the 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 Homelander Renaissance, as it will, where. It's or like where he's going to realize that he don't need no, like no woman to tell him how to run his life. That like stereotypical man value, and he's gonna have Soldier Boy come in and be like, "You you have been soft all this time. You need me to come in here and teach you how to be a real man." To the point they end up like fucking like they do in the comics. Like there's gonna yes. be that moment. So like that's my glorious <laughs> thought process. Bro, tell me I'm not wrong. I'm calling this right now. We have to wait a year. I'm calling it right now. That Jensen see, Ackles is going to look me right in the eye and say, be a real man and fuck me. And I'll be like, yes. See, honestly, I that's mean, my favorite pitfall of toxic masculinity. It's like, you're so masculine, it's gay now. Yes. <laughs> what, what's more manly than two men? Exactly. Like, that, nothing. Nothing at all. Idealize that, that Greco-Roman history, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, like, you have that whole joke that all, like, the neckbeards and the idiots like to use where it's, like, that like they stole this from the fucking Omegaverse. It's hilarious. The whole, like, alpha and omega shit or the alpha and beta shit. And they're like, oh, you beta males, you're nothing to me. I feel like that's literally going to be Jensen Ackles' character. He's going to walk in and, ca- and call a Homelander a beta to his face and say, you want to be an alpha? You got to prove it. And he's going to have to fight the fuck, like, Soldier Boy to get it. Or, like, there's going to be something that like that happens where... A Homelander has to go through like go through that full transformation because similar to the whole idea of Homelander not having a mom, Homelander didn't have, really have a dad I, uh, either except for the scientist dude. So if Soldier Boy walks in and shows dominance and power bottoms and says, "I'm your daddy now," it's over. <laughs> it's over. <laughs> like so, I'm calling it now that Jensen Ackles is gonna walk in and, sh- and, and slap his like his ass and be like, "Come, in, like, like I- I'm your mind now." Would it be a super bottom? <laughs> Holy shit! Oh my God. <laughs> is that the name of this episode? <laughs> no, the, 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 the episode is which like a fresca. <laughs> I'm so proud of that. Um, so, um, but, go ahead, Mary. I don't hear what are your thoughts speaking, for season three. Uh, speaking to the futures, so, that you know, we we dealt in this season. We dealt a lot with uh, Trump's America. Basically, is that. All of Stormfront's rallies and the ethno state, the ethno state, you know, white supremacy bullshit, it, it is very topical. But there was also a kind of a political layer hidden underneath with Victoria Newman. Now, Victoria Newman is sort of a comic book character with Vic the V, Victor Newman, who is in the comic book, who eventually does become the president. However, they did a lot of rewriting with Vic the V that that Victoria Newman is obviously painfully obviously alexandria ocasio cortez yes Mm -hmm. you know kind of that young upstart because we see in her congressional office or her campaign office or whatever at the end she's from queens Mm -hmm. Uh, is aoc from brooklyn she's from somewhere in new york she's from one of the boroughs so i mean a young upstart congresswoman from the boroughs of new york like she is obviously alexandria ocasio cortez and uh, I wonder if... Uh, part, uh, East, uh, district she's from the, the Bronx. Eastern, Bronx yeah. From the Bronx, okay. I'm from Indiana. New York all looks the same to me. <laughs> Don't but, say that uh, there. Mm-hmm, yeah. Oh, God, no, 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 no. I am not stupid. Uh-uh. <laughs> yep. But, um, no, she's obviously AOC. And I like that, because I like that political commentary a little bit. But at the same time, in the comic books, Vic the Veep does become the president. And we find out at the end of season two that Victoria Newman is the soup that can blow people, like that can just make people have their heads blow up. Yep. Like because we have the BVS scene with the with the trials with uh, the congressional hearing, we have that you know BVS homage where instead of a bomb going off, you know Victoria Newman's just making everybody's heads blow up. Yep. Like she has an agenda because Homelander was in the room. And we saw her, the not uh, A train uh, speedster guy, I forget his name. Shockwave. Shockwave. She blew his head up, so she can clearly use it on other soups. Homelander was not even 10 feet from her. Why didn't she use it on Homelander? Exactly. Why didn't she, why didn't she use it on Stormfront? I'm, I'm just, Political I'm glad theater. Ashley. 
<laughs> I'm glad Ashley didn't get her brain exploded. Oh, poor Ashley. She was just covered in blood. Could... I love how she looks at a homelander and goes, Your superheroes fucking do something! And they're just like, We don't know what the fuck to do, bro. Yeah. And, you know, not only did she tank out what I can only assume would be rival congressmen, or even just to kind of cover her ass, because I made a comment that, oh, her chief of staff got her head blown up, and Victoria's like, because afterwards, Victoria, my wife, Victoria, not the character Victoria, <laughs> my wife, Victoria, basically said, well, she's got to cover her ass. I mean, she has to make it look conspicuously not her. And she even has that line where she flat out looks uh, at, at uh, freaking uh, Bobby from uh, Supernatural and goes, yo, my chief of staff is fucking brains were all, were all over my face like an hour ago. And it's like, damn, you're barely affected by this. That's a little suspect. And I'm mad that I mm-hmm. didn't notice that because I thought it was going to be the dude from Scientology. I thought it was yeah, I him. Too. I did too. And uh, she has an agenda because she didn't take out Homelander, but she took out the Scientology guy. Yup. Like, it's just, that was such a cool twist there at the end that you find out, because you, uh, she also took out the CIA lady earlier in the season. Yep. yep. First person mm-hmm. you see her take out. Mm-hmm. And something that I thought was a really interesting red herring is that as uh, Deep and A-Train are in the bar watching it, when heads start exploding, the Deep, he starts feeling around on his head. because like, oh. Because I either thought it was Scientology or I thought it was Vought trying to interrupt the hearings. Exactly. That's why I like what, what, what made me think was it was Scientology, especially before Dude's head blew up, was the fact that Deep got the shaft again. Like, he mm-hmm. used Deep on purpose to fuck with Vought even more, and then it was, oh no, he's just dead. I'm like, damn. So, we went, we like, we didn't blow past the white supremacist narrative, I think... I honestly think Stormfront is just the beginning of this hyper-political white supremacist Nazi narrative. Is that Stormfront is not dead. I I, I believe that she's not dead. I think Aya Cash was really popular this season. I think they're going to try and find a way to bring her back. Robo-Nazi. Robo-Nazi. You know, Robo-Cop mm-hmm. the shit out of that Nazi. But We can rebuild her. I think that we're going to get a, I think we're going to get a lot more political intrigue next season because this season it was a lot of like social media politics you know because it was such a heavy focus on memes and just how mundane radicalization can actually can can actually be so i think we've kind of gotten through that into what nationalism actually looks like from a suit from like an inner working political level fair enough um travis what do you want to see from season three of this show <clears throat> um, if I'm being honest, and this is gonna be fucked up, but I want to see Huey hardened by soup abuse, and whether that come from Homelander or Black Noir, I don't care. To be completely honest with you, but I think he's too pure for this show, and I think he needs a little a little grim darkening so he can come a little back to the light. If that makes any sense. If he's working, um, if he's working with Vic the Veep, though. As I'm saying, like I think he's gonna have like one of those. I I, I think he's gonna have a Zhu Lee from um, a Legend of Korra moment where he dick rides the fuck out of out of, out of Vic the Veep, and then like he's even gonna have that moment too where he like betrays the boys and like says, "I pledge my loyalty to you," only for it to be bullshit. And I think yeah, that's gonna he- that's gonna be that moment where you where you want him again. See, I want I want an Anakin Skywalker moment where he lets Mace Windu kill Palpatine with Huey. That's what I want. Because Vic the Veep definitely puts off the energy like, hey, I'm here for the better good, but she lets Stormfront and Homelander live. So is she for the greater good or is she for her own advancement? That's the question. And Huey being, you know, a normal guy who's also been around soups and soup terrorists and then, of course, Kimiko, he... He has the capacity to see through her after he takes the rose-colored glasses off. Mm. And I'm not sure how that's going to play out. If it's even... If maybe they'll do that for, like, a two-season stretch. I don't know. But I want to see Huey in the trenches a bit more, so to speak. Fair enough. Um, Alec, what, what, are you, what, what is, the, what is the, like, the big thing that you want from season three? Um... One theory I have is that we're going to get a 
big time skip with season three. Ooh. Like, I'm talking Ooh. years later. Like, Huey will be an established part of AO of a. <laughs> well, yes, this. Ridiculously you know, not AOC. Yeah. Of a uh, Newman's team. Uh, even maybe becoming a politician himself somehow. Yeah. Um, uh, Butcher, I could see just him, like, just wallowing, um, getting arrested a shit ton with, like, bar fights and stuff, because he has no direction now. Like, yeah, he does. He, 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 like, he was offered the, the job of the, new, of the new division. I think he's in a new division. He, out, he doesn't really have a wife to protect anymore or, like, fight for anymore because she's dead. So, he's like, got a family. He's, he's, got, he's got the boys. So, like, if Kimiko, Frenchie, and, Mo, and, and them stay with him, I think he'll be all right. Uh, we'll, we'll see because it looks like they all go off on their own at, for now at least at the end of the season. But okay. who, who knows? Like, who knows? Um, something I think will happen in season three is that Huey will have to – be face to face with Homelander, and Homelander's gonna like just meticulously kick his fucking teeth in, and that's gonna make him just grow the f up essentially. Um, I need to see. Like, oh, go ahead. Oh, um, also, I think the season will end with Homelander going sicko mode. And doing the thing he wanted to do in episode five, which is just commit mass murder yes. against a bunch of civilians. I think that's how I think I thought that was how this season was going to end, but I think that's how season three will end because, like, somehow, some way that video will get leaked and I, I, he will start his reign of terror. I, but, think, uh, I think we're gonna get a Justice Lords, and what I mean by that is, I think. There's gonna come a point where like there was that that speech at the end of the show where um he's like we are your superheroes like that screamed to me that he was reaching his breaking point and then like we have the jerk off moment but I think he's going to once Soldier Boy comes in and kicks his ass I think he's gonna pull a, a, a Justice Lord Superman and say fuck Edgar fuck all this bullshit I want to be president. And that's gonna be a literal like fight between um, Vic and him to see who will be the one to run the country. Will it be the soup or the other soup? Because sooner or later, Vic's gonna get revealed. That's what my, I, I think it's gonna happen there. I don't think he's gonna mass kill everyone. I think he's gonna have super a soldier boy in his ear, like, "Yo, you could do this. You could do this shit. Like that kind of shit." I mean, and. Vic the V doesn't make it. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, one other thing I wanted to say. Um, I think a big thing next season is going to be about... Because this season was very much about, uh, you know, uh, the alt-right, essentially, an indoctrination of uh, young people into the alt-right. I mean, the fucking PewDiePie joke. Like, that, that, That's that, something. like, That's says... Something. Yeah. Oh, oh, no. Uh... I think next season is going to be about how um, essentially the two-party system in America is just fucked because yeah. they're all the same, essentially. And how, like, and how Victoria Newman is essentially, like, going to be the one to show how it's, like, the the establishment Democrats and, I guess another term would be neoliberals would, are, like, in cahoots with the Republicans and alt rights and stuff, and they're in cahoots with you know big corporations, big pharma. In this case, Vought. Like it's all just a machine to to create more conflict, to create more outrage, to create more like pa power, essentially. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think that's going to be a big talking point. Um, I trust that they can pull it off. Because they pulled oh, yeah. it off so far, so I don't see why they wouldn't now. And I just the one thing that I wanted to mention, um, aside from your point, is that uh, something I think they did really well this season was um, something Stormfront says at the very end. She says, "People like what I believe. They like what I say. They just don't like the word Nazi." And I think that kind of just slapped. I think it was just it. It, it was a call out. Yep. 
but mm-hmm. I, I think that's just the deftness with which these writers handle the situation. Um, I remember something that Victoria, my wife Victoria, pointed out is that she's wondering if season three will feature an election. Yeah. Because, mm-hmm. you know, Vivek does eventually become president. So, you know, kind of tying into Alex's time, Alex, Alec, your name is not Alec, it's Alec. <laughs> Alex time skip idea. I'm sorry, I stumbled. Um, but to tie in with his time skip idea, I think we might go into an election because, as you know, my wife pointed out, like mm, it's kind of fertile territory, especially with the shit show 2020 has been. Yep. Yeah. And then we'll, I, but, think, I think we'll have like like the Homelander versus Vic in the election. That would be fucking baller. Huey might be uh, Vic's VP running mate. And one thing that I absolutely need in season three is Huey, Elena, and Ashley having a moment, having a we didn't sign up for this shit moment. Like yes. that's, uh, they need that. I, I really need uh, how the uh, fuck did we get into this moment? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, I, we just I, all I, wanted to do jobs. I, I just I really want freaking Ashley to just like at some point, just walk into Esposito's office with a fucking baseball bat, and she's just done. Like, I, my health is not worth this. Like, that would be the... Like, I want my pension. I want, like, an island. I want to be gone. Like, that is literally the moment I want for Ashley. She deserves he, everything. And he would just sit in his seat, complete, like, unmoving, even if she... No, because I can see Esposito giving it to her because, like, there's only so much that, like, s- like someone can take. And I feel like Esposito would be like, all right, whatever. And either he'll give it to her or White in the world will snap her fucking neck. Like, I think... It- it, at the same time, Ashley knows too much. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Ashley knows way too much. Maybe Ashley yes. might be the mole. Like she might be the um the Corporal Hicks of, 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 the, of, the, of the next season where she just leaks it all. Here's my question, is that um, do we think Maeve is going to die in season three? Because her death is a turning point in the comic book. I think it's yes, because she she's kind of burnt out her length. And what, when it comes to the, like, the Homelander video getting out, it'll probably be when Maeve ends up biting it. I can see her death being... Because they have said in the show that the only person who rivals Homelander in strength is Maeve. So I think the ending of season three might be this huge brawl between the two Mm -hmm. and it will end with her dying. But as a contingency, like, and this will probably be if, if they do the election thing that Mary uh, talked about, uh, like, and if Homelander is running for president, she will leak that as a contingency for her dying, and then Homelander will just go sicko mode and sicko just mode. like at it at ah! his ino- at his inauguration. No. <laughs> at his inauguration, he will just laser everybody in front of the White House. Uh, all right, folks, we're gonna go ahead and wrap up the show. Next week, we will be returning with a new spot, like spotlight, where we will be going back to the the, the legions of Marvel books that we are have neglected over time because we do cover a lot of DC here. But we will be venturing into one of our favorites, Al Ewing's Ultimates. So get ready for that fun ass time because I can't I- wait to talk about Blue Marvel dropping Hulk in one right. Like that entire book is just got to here. So like when I when I, when you hear me constantly say hashtag bring back ultimates, I'm freaking serious because this book will blow your fucking minds. So, uh, Alec, you are the guest. You are up on the chopping block first. What is your closing statement for this episode of Panel to Panel? The Boys, I think, is the best show on TV right now, and I think by the end of it, it will be the Breaking Bad of the 2020s. Fair enough. Um, Travis, what is your closing statement for this episode of Panel to Panel? Uh, this, this episode was brought to you by Brave Maid Pride Bars. <laughs> yes! Yes! Um, Mary, what is your closing statement after that one was stolen from you? Oh, I didn't even think of it, so it's beautiful. Um, but, uh, I, I think my closing statement is that I also like the visual 
thematic elements of the show because they pull a lot from Zack Snyder's very overt visuals. And I thought that was very clever that, you know, some of the most uh, recognizable visuals they pulled from that. And I think that's something they did very well. Fair enough. Um, Slow my, Superman descent. My closing statement is Amazon, I need you to respond to my tweet. I want to know what brand Mother's Milk's leather jacket is. I can't find it. I want to know because I want it. I, I, I've been in, in, like looking for that jacket for, for a year and a half now, and I still can't find it. So please holla at me. Um, Send me a pic of it. I I can try to find it for okay, you. Okay, but like, there's all these like dumbass like movie jacket like websites. They're like, we have Mother's Milk's jacket. I'm like, fuck you. No, you don't. So like, it, it'll <laughs> it'll take a little bit of work. Um, so we well, don't forget, folks, that you listen to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, YouTube, all those great places. You can follow us on Twitter at PTP underscore podcast, where you can talk to our amazing social media uh, assistant, Ian. Uh, he will be on in a few weeks for a special project we will be announcing uh, soon. Um, that'll be a fun time for everybody. Uh, you can also follow the website uh, on Comics Ground on Twitter and Instagram at on Comics Ground, and you can check out the website on ComicsGround.com. Put some hyphens between those words for me, and you can check out all of our awesome content there. We will catch you folks next time right here at Panel Two Panel. Peace out. Peace.